Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the special meeting of Falkirk Council held today, Tuesday, the 15th of February. In accordance with Section 43 of the Local Government in Scotland Act 2003, it has been directed that this meeting will be conducted in such a manner as to allow remote attendance by elected members. In accordance with Section 58 of the Local Government Scotland Act 1973, the public are excluded from this meeting, as it is likely that if members of the public were present, there would be a real and substantial risk to public health due to infection or contamination with coronavirus. This meeting will be live streamed via the Council website. I'll go straight now to Mr Moody for the sederant. Thank you, Mr Moody. Thank you, Provost. Provost Buchanan. Present. Deputy Provost Ritchie. Present. Councillor Aitchison. Yeah. Councillor Alexander. Present. Councillor Balfour. Apologies, um, he's actually having some technical issues. Um, it would be a bit like others with Wi-Fi this morning, but he's going to try and get in as soon as possible. Thanks very much. Councillor Binney. Present. And we have apologies from Councillor Bissett. Councillor Black. Present. Councillor Blackwood. Present. Councillor Coleman. Present. Councillor Colley. Present. Councillor Coombs. Present. Councillor Flynn. The same as the uh, other councillors, he's he'll get in when he when he can get in. Thanks, Councillor Kerr. Councillor Garner. Present. Apologies from Councillor Goldie, Councillor Grant. Present. Councillor Harris. Present. Councillor Hughes. Present. Councillor Kerr. Present. Councillor McHugh. Present. Councillor McClucky. Yeah. Councillor Meeklejohn. Present. Present. Councillor Monroe. Present. Thank you. Councillor Murta. In shock. Councillor Nicol. Present. Councillor Nimmo. Present. Councillor Patrick. Present. Councillor Russell. Present. And Councillor Spears. Present. Thank you. Good morning, Councillor uh, Mr. Mr. Moody. Sorry for being a wee bit late. We had trouble getting in, but but I am here. I do apologise, Councillor Bowes. Thank you very much, Councillor Bowes. Okay then, uh, thank you, Mr. Moody. Um, before we go on to the to the agenda proper, I've just got two intimations to make. The first one is members or maybe recall or maybe I've seen in the press or maybe from other people that one of the uh, our members who was a long-standing member of Falkirk Council for many many years. Uh, Councillor Pat McCafferty sadly passed away. Um, Councillor McCafferty held many positions within uh, Falkirk Council, Falkirk District Council. He was the police convener. I remember when I first came in, he was a police convener. He was also the convener of housing, and he had he held a great, great stature within his community of Greensmouth. I'm going to go over to um, the leader of the, the council to see if she's got any comments, and then I'll ask any members that recall Councillor McCafferty during this period if they would like to say say something. Uh, Councillor Michael John. Thank you, Provost. Um, I would just like to, to pay tribute to um, ex Councillor McCafferty. Um, while I, I never served with him, he'd left the council by the time I was elected in 2007. I was very much aware of him and the work that he'd done. And um, having lived and grown up in Grangemouth, was, was very aware of the organisations and the work that he did within Grangemouth, very much um, laterally with, with older people. And um, he, he, he did a, a huge amount of, of community work. And even more so once um, he actually uh, retired from the council. Um, he got to the grand old age of 92. Um, he was awarded the OBE. And um, I know that his family will, will certainly miss him dreadfully, as will um, the people of Grangemouth um, for the work that he's done and um, the service that he provided to Falkirk Council. Um, he was very well respected um, by officers and some um, who still remember um, him as Councillor McCafferty talk of him very fondly. Um, so thoughts are certainly with his family um, at this time. Thank you, Provost. 
Okay, thank you. Councillor Nicol, I believe you want to say something. Uh, yes, thank you very much, for Travis. Um, when I joined Falkirk District Council in 1983, Pat had already served the people of Grangemouth for the best part of two decades. He was uh, elected, first of all, to Grangemouth Town Council, and I think I would be right in saying that he was uh, the last surviving member of Grangemouth Town Council. So then he served on Central Regional Council, and he was the regional councillor covering uh, the ward that I was elected to in 1983. So I worked very closely with Pat and saw just how popular he was within the community and justifiably so because of all the work uh, that he did on behalf of that community. As the leader has just said, he served to 2007, um, moving from the regional council to uh, Falkirk the district council reorganization. But even in 2007, when he stood down from the council, he still served the people of Grangemouth in bodies such as Talbot House and the Grangemouth Heritage Trust. And almost to the end of his life, he was out there serving uh, the, the community. He was a great man to have as your mentor uh, to young councillors in the early days. Uh, I have very main, many fond memories of him and many memories of friendly arguments and discussions. Uh, with him. He was a man of great principle, uh, largely uh, brought uh, to him by his upbringing and by his strong Christian faith. Uh, I'll certainly miss Pat. Uh, in later years, he regularly was uh, uh, round about the town, uh, came into the shop to have a chat with, with me if I was there. And uh, I also send uh, my condolences to his family. He'll be sadly missed. Thank you, Provost. Thank you, Councillor Spears. Just to add my condolences to that that has already been said. Pat, for me, just wasn't a neighbour, just a friend. He was also a neighbour. Um, we saw each other um, every other day, and it's uh, he'll be sadly, sadly missed in the town. I can't really add to everything that's already been said, but um, we miss you, Pat and rest in peace. Okay, thank you for your input. Is there anybody else who'd like to comment? Uh, Councillor Nimmo, I see your hand up. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Sorry. thanks, Travis. I knew Pat uh, as well, uh, and I'd just like to take this opportunity on behalf of the, the Labour Group just to, to pay tribute to, to Pat McCafferty uh, for all the work that he did as an elected member of the, the Council and also for all the, the work and the engagement he did within his ward in Grangemouth. I know he was very appreciated uh, by the people of Grangemouth. Thanks, Provost. OK, thank you for your input, sir. Would anybody else like to comment? Yes, Provost. Provost, uh, Councillor Patrick here. Yes, Councillor Patrick. Uh, Provost, uh, I, I wouldn't, couldn't possibly add to it more to the um, comments of, made by my colleague, Councillor Nicol, but um, uh, I must say that um, I have fond memories of, of Pat and his time in with the, together in the Council. He was an absolute gentleman, and uh, while, uh, as has been said, we can't always say that we agreed entirely uh, in, in everything, but he, he was a perfect, helpful, a very helpful person uh, it, to be a, called a friend in the council, and um, he will indeed be sadly missed. I uh, I can only have great, have greatest admiration for the way he not only conducted himself while in the council, but all the many years which he contributed to the people of Greensmouth uh, thereafter. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your input, Councillor Black. Just very briefly, I, th I think I agreed wholeheartedly with everything that Councillor Nicholl said. But I was a, I was a new councillor uh, when, after Pat stepped down in Grangemouth, and he was very helpful to me. He would sometimes phone me up and tell me where he thought I'd maybe missed missed something I should have been doing. He was always quick to tell me what was the right thing to do, and he he, he was a he was a good mentor. He was also full of fun, and he had a dry sense of humour, and I'll miss his smile. Uh, it was deeply loved by the people at Talbot House, uh, and he had—he he just was a a, a a true gentleman. 
Okay, thank you for your input. Councillor Coombs. Just a quick comment, again, reinforcing what's been said. Um, I knew Pat before I was a councillor, um, and I think it would be remiss of me if I didn't mention the work that he did, obviously, for his community, but also within the church uh, at the Sacred Heart in Grangemouth. He was, uh, as has been said, a true gentleman. He was decent, honest and hardworking. And I think that that's the true measure. And uh, yeah, I, I think, as I said, he should be, him and his family should be proud of the work that he did and the unpaid work for many years that he did within the community of Grangemouth. Thanks, Provost. Uh, thank you for your input, Councillor Coombs. Would anybody else like to say anything as we move on? I think the, everybody will recognise that the Falkirk Council, both members and officials and anybody that knew him, pass on our sincere condolences to the family at this time. Yeah, thank you. Now we have another notification here. <clears throat> Stumport sad again. It's um, this is Stuart Ritchie, Director of Corporate and Housing Services. This is Stuart's last meeting of the council, and I'm going to pass you straight over to the leader of the council to offer some tribute for the work that Stuart has done in the many years he has served this council. Thank you. Um, I think um, as we um, don't necessarily get the opportunities um, to meet informally um, these days, I think it's important, particularly when we have um, so members of staff leaving, to be able to, to um, thank them for, for all the work that they've done um, going forward. So I, I um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, Stuart joined the Council in 1989 um, and he started work as an accountant. Um, he worked in a range of, of um, contract functions just to, to improve and deliver best value for the Council. He successfully brought the maintenance contracts back in house and the Chupi Rat transfer of the staff back into the Council. And I know that there's members around here that will remember that process. Um, he worked um, on the team responsible for delivering five new secondary schools across Falkirk. Um, it was one of the first PFI schools in Scotland. And while there are reflections on whether PFI um, was good or not, um, personally, um, the, the fact was that it was a project that was delivered and Stuart delivered that on behalf of the council as it was set their decision and um, that delivery was successful. He worked in many an election account over the years and has seen many um, elected members come and go. Um, and he finally became a director in 1998. He took responsibility for housing and supported its transformation into a successful service following a very poor inspection report. And, and that has been built on um, since then to what we have today. He also developed the concept of the transformational programme, which has seen progress and evolve into a well-established Council of the Future programme. He's guided us through some very difficult budgets, and um, I know that um, the Council took some of his colleagues and some of the advice given to, to members um, over the years was very, very welcomed, and that, that will be missed. Um, and he's worked with very many colleagues and, and a well-respected director, and can appear sort of quiet and unassuming at times um, and, and worked away uh, very quietly in the background and would always have time to give to people who needed it. He spent a lot of time building a strong team, developing their skills and ensuring that they can deliver the best that they can be for the council. And I know that his team will re really miss him. Stuart um, is, is, is looking to, to go on to do other things. Um, he will now be able to spend time um, playing golf. Um, on the golf course and curing his handicap and um, time, spend time with family and friends. And I know that he has um, a, a new nephew um, that has, has um, come along during lockdown and being able to see and spend time with him will be an absolute joy for him. Um, he's also indicated that um, one of his, his desires is to, to give something back into, into the communities and we'll be looking to do some charity work. And of course, um, I am sure he will be more regular um, at his beloved St Mirren football team um, as a season ticket holder. And um, maybe one day we'll be able to see the Falkirk St Mirren again and uh, be able to share that, Stuart. But I wish you the very, very best of luck um, in, in your retirement. 
um, which isn't really retirement. You're just moving to a new phase in your life. But wish you the very, very best of luck um, in everything that you do and all the best to your family. Thank you, Stuart. Hey, thank you very much for input, <laughs> Councillor Michael John. Anybody else like to comment at this stage? Uh, we've got Councillor Kerr and then Councillor Bowes. Councillor Kerr. Thanks, Provost. And can I just concur with uh, the Leader of the Council? Uh, Stuart, uh, for me, he's always been an honest officer. He's always gave the respect to an elected member. Uh, I've had many open conversations with Stuart, and I'll miss those conversations. And I hope and pray that the semi-retirement that comes uh, from the Council We'll give them time uh, to spend and enjoy the things that matter most to him. And I hope his health lasts for many years to enjoy these activities. Uh, so on behalf of the Conservative Unions Group, I'd just like to thank Stuart for the advice and the, the work that he's done in the many years in the Council. Thank you, Provost. Thanks for your input, Councillor Clare. Councillor Bowes, then Councillor Spears, then Councillor Black. Yeah, thank you, Provost. Can I concur with um, the words of the Leader of the Council and the Leader of the Conservative Group um, on, on their thoughts about Stuart? In the last four and three quarter years, we'll call it, it's getting awfully close to five years. Um, got to, I've got to know Stuart reasonably well through my portfolio. Um, but you know, it's not the portfolio work that, that, that I want to talk about because my time dealing with Stuart, he is he, he really is a Mr. Falkirk. Literally, he cuts Stuart and he bleeds Falkirk. He doesn't bleed, bleed blood. He is so passionate and has been so passionate about the Falkirk area. It comes it comes through extremely strongly. On top of that, uh, and the other thing that, that really uh, struck me about him and given his role in the council, his passion for the people that he worked with, notice my, my words, worked with, was, was incredible. He cared 100% for, for everybody that worked with him. There is no more I think you can ask of somebody in their working life, as they're passionate about what they do, and they're passionate about the people they do it with. I thank you, Stuart, uh, for the last, we'll call it five years. Um, you've taught me a lot, uh, and hopefully I'm going to use that for, for the good of the Council at some point as well. Thanks for your input, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Spears. Thank you. Um, just to wish you a very happy and long retirement. It does not surprise me in the least that it's a semi-retirement and he's going to go on and work in different fields. But, um, you know, it's, it's like Councillor McCaffrey and a lot of people who's been in public life that they, they when they retire, they want to go on and give something back. Uh, and that's very typical of Stuart. I wish you and your family a very hot, long, happy and productive retirement. Thank you, Input Councillor. Councillor Black. I can see uh, Councillor Nimmer's hand up, so I'm, I'm sure he's going to talk on behalf of the Labour Group. But uh, as, a, as a new councillor and as a councillor in the administration, I really valued and the whole, the whole group really valued Stuart's uh, guidance and leadership and sometimes Stuart was always very open and frank and honest and sometimes that could hurt because some of the things sometimes he would tell you would be difficult to hear but it was always the right things he, he always kept us right and when you looked back on reflection and you thought about what he'd said to you you would think ah I really need to watch what I'm doing next time or I need to do things differently or I need to take nice and say that and make sure that I get it right and he was always a champion as well as the people of Falkirk for a champion for his staff because he knew how hard his staff worked and if you ever went to us leave and do and obviously councillors don't go to a lot of leave and do's but I've been to a couple of we leave and do's up in the third floor and if you, you could see there how much the staff appreciated Stuart how how much they valued him and how much they loved him so we will all miss Stuart uh, the councillor's going to be the poorer. The council's going to be the poorer for no having Stuart there. But other people and other agencies and other groups are going to really value that input because at the heart of everything that Stuart does is honesty, and that's something that's really needed. Thank you, Provost. 
Thank you for your input, Councillor Black. Councillor Nimmo. Thanks, thanks, Provost. I'd just like to echo everything that's already been said by members. I've personally known Stuart for 15 years now, since I was elected first back in 2007, uh, and I found him to be a very supporting officer over this period. Uh, simply, I'd just like to wish him all the best for the future on behalf of the Labour Group and have a, a long and happy retirement, Stuart. I hope your golf handicap manages to come down. Uh, and I'm sure you'll be able to let people know if that's the case. Get plenty of practice and have a, a long and happy retirement. Thank you, Provost. Okay, thank you. Councillor Coombs. Thanks, Provost. It's just very quickly because Alison has obviously had the same sort of um, honest approach from Stuart that I've had when we've uh, in our debates with him, where absolutely for the first, I think, three years. Uh, I perhaps didn't appreciate Stuart's um, approach. Uh, that blunt honesty um, is something that I grew into and, and very much appreciated. And I just repeat what I said uh, about Pat McCafferty. Stuart is absolutely a decent, honest, hardworking man. And I think that's the measure by which we should set the bar. So have fun, Stuart, and uh, you'll be missed, although I'm not sure how much you'll miss us. Thanks. Thank you for your input, Councillor Coombs. Councillor McClucky. Thanks, <coughs> Thanks Provost. Uh, Mr Ritchie was um, one of the best officers, I would say the best officer that um, I've come across in the 15 year of the Council. And uh, such is my respect for a man that as I say, I think he's the only senior officer I've never fell out with. Um, and you know, I'm consistent, but you know, never could a, a question uh, the man's ability, the man's knowledge, and uh, you know, in trying to help people and the people of Falkirk and doing his job. Um, with great respect for him. And as I say, he's got a big loss to the council because there's no na do they're going to fill a pair of, pair of shoes that he fits, uh, that he was wearing, you know. So. And um, it's going to be a big loss. So, um, but I wish him well. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for your input, Councillor McClucky. Is there anybody else like to speak at this stage? No. Okay. Just, just to finalise, uh, to say, Stuart, that I think every member of this council, members and and officials, um, have the utmost respect for you, and we all wish you very well in your retirement. But I'm quite sure that in the next few months that you'll be seconded or you'll be as some sort of consultant because your talents are too great to be missed. OK, then, thank you very much for that. Thank you, everybody. OK, that takes us to declaration of interest back to the agenda. Members should declare any financial and non-financial interest they have in any item of business in the meeting, identifying the relevant agenda item and the nature of the interest. Have we any declarations of interest at this time? No? Okay, then, thank you for that. That takes us to item three on your agenda this morning. Falkirk Council Best Value Assurance Report. The report is by our Chief Executive. It's pages 2 to 13 on your agenda papers. Thank you, Mr Laurie. And thank you, Provost, and good morning, and uh, good morning uh, to all. So, following the um, best value audit last year, this report outlines the recommendations from the best value assurance report, uh, the accounts commission findings, and the proposed Falkirk Council uh, best value action plan uh, for members' uh, consideration. <clears throat> the best value performance report was considered by the accounts commission on the 9th of December last year. It was published by Audit Scotland on the 13th of January um, this year, and the final report was shared uh, with elected members at that time. The report sets out the key areas of focus for the audit which was undertaken last year, so that relates to the Council's vision and strategic direction, performance and the pace of improvement, uh, including public performance reporting, the effective use of resources, including financial sustainability, uh, the impact of the transformation programme and workforce planning, 
partnership working community engagement continuous improvement including progress since the previous best value follow-up report um, and a number of key messages which are supplemented with the commission's findings in the final report and also of course the recommendations for further improvement there are nine of these and the proposed uh, response in terms of the action plan is set out at appendix one the accounts commission findings um, themselves include some quite stark messages for the council and um, they express their disappointment um, that insufficient progress is being made by the council in its improvement they express their serious concern that they have not yet seen the degree of collaborative leadership required to deliver change that is needed and they express their lack of confidence that the council will meet a projected budget gap of 70 million pounds over the next five years now that latter finding in particular can be of no surprise um, to us in the context of uh, the repeated uh, warnings we've had about our position vis-a-vis -vis financial sustainability uh, in recent um, external audit uh, reports and members of course are acutely aware of that in the context of the forthcoming um, budget decisions the accounts commission also note that all members need to demonstrate their ability to take difficult decisions on how the council is to transform its services and such decisions do need to be taken forward urgently there are positive elements to the report as well it refers to recent improvements in terms of how the council is taking forward the council's future program it talks about the good performance of many um, council services and whilst that's perhaps not a major feature of the report i think in the context of what we do uh, for our local communities it is exceptionally important it refers to the effective response to the pandemic, which we've spoken about a number of times uh, previously in the Council, um, and under, un underlines how it's helping improve our engagement with communities. Though specifically, it does talk about the Council needing to do more with its community planning partners to empower communities and get locality plans in place. So, as I said, there are nine main recommendations in the report they'll be used to um, take forward improvement across the council they're set out in appendix one together with details of lead officers for each of these and time scales for implementation and in developing um, the action plan uh, we have had engagement sessions both with officers um, and indeed um, with elected uh, members we had three locality based um, workshops um, in uh, January uh, and we had a, a, a broader discussion uh, session with members back um, in December my colleagues and I felt that um, these were largely positive and constructive engagements I felt that um, both elected members and officers um, showed a strong desire to make the changes that need um, to be made um, and I suppose what I would say is it's one thing to uh, talk about that intent and um, our challenge of course is all around about the delivery of that and making uh, making a difference and certainly from um, the point of view of elected members and for officers supporting elected members in taking this forward that will include the design and implementation of a very full uh, and I hope very effective induction program and longer term development program for members following the forthcoming um, election. So the recommendations in the um, action plan fall under uh, seven themes, uh, leadership, transformation, performance, capital communities, uh, folk community trust and equalities. As I say, a lead officer has been assigned uh, to each and the lead officer will drive the work in these areas and ensure that progress reports are forthcoming in line with the existing Council of the Future Governance arrangements and also as appropriate to the Executive Audit and Scrutiny um, Committees. We'll also publish these on the Falkirk Performs 
uh, website for the purposes of public performance reporting. And as chief exec, I'll take overall responsibility for the delivery of this plan. It is likely that the Accounts Commission will conduct the next best value assurance exercise for Falkirk Council as part of the next five year program, probably late in 2023. That gives us limited time to demonstrate uh, progress and there is urgent work to be done. So we need to, uh, we need to get on with that and the uh, purpose of the action plan, the time scales within that are designed to achieve that end. And finally, I'd, I'd um, uh, simply draw members' attention also to the resources paragraph set out at 6.2. So um, the recommendation uh, today is that members note uh, the Falkirk Council Best Value Assurance Report and the Accounts Commission findings and approve the Best Value Strategic Action Plan uh, for Falkirk Council. Um, thank you, Provost. Happy to uh, deal with any questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Laurie. I'll go straight to the Leader of the Council. Councillor Michael John. Thank you, Provost, and, and um, thanks to the Chief Executive for um, his report. Um, I would have to say that I fully support um, the findings um, of, of the report and believe that um, they are a fair reflection and indeed the recommendations um, that go with the report um, sets out the, the work that needs to be done. Um, the report, uh, as, as uh, Mr. Laurie has said, notes the progress that's been made, uh, that had, had been made in 2018 from the, the 2015 16 audits, and, and that, that was encouraging. However, um, the pace of change and transformation has not been um, at a satisfactory level to make the progress that's required to provide financial stability to the Council over the next five years. There's a number of reasons for that, and the the report um, details them um, going through, um, including the fact that the Council is a minority administration and has to rely on other political parties for support. Um, the over-reliance on use of reserves to meet the budget gaps and not service transformation and savings with elected members not um, being willing to take difficult decisions. Uh, there's a clear strategy um, to reduce the budget gaps must um, be seen um, have more increased. It's clear that the strategy to reduce the bus budget gaps must be, see an increase in the pace of our transformational programme. Um, keeping things in context, that, that is consistent with the messages for all councils across Scotland. But we have to reflect on the fact that Falkirk is 10 years plus behind where other councils actually are. Our change programme has already delivered benefits through the rollout of the digital devices to school pupils. Our sector reading analogue to the digital project, which will increase the ability for independent living at home um, for our vulnerable citizens and increase the efficiency of our employees working from home or using digital technology to help programme jobs to the front line. However, we need to do more to transform what we do and how we do it. Our pace of change needs to be quicker as we recover from COVID. Our change programme needs to deliver climate change, economy, recovery, digital transformation, community empowerment, succeed today, excel tomorrow and closer to home. Um, a corporate plan and, and business plan, which are to be finalised in, in the autumn, needs to be a springboard for that change. The recent review that has taken place with the, the support of the consultants PwC is to um, review the, the transformational programme and make it more robust. And with that, we are seeing some starts of improvement. However, there's much more that needs to be done by way of additional projects in order to make that sustainability gap and um, to meet our obligations for the next five years. The report talks a lot around um, collaborative leadership, and that is something that has been missing from the way the Council operates, um, giving challenges to the effective effectiveness of the Council. Challenges of the polarised politics with the Council was something that was recognised by the MP administration in 2018 and in an attempt to change and improve the workings of the council and ensure that good decisions were made, the administration did bring forward proposals for members on collaborative leadership. This was unfortunately rejected at that time. In an attempt to foster more collaboration um, and approach as a minority administration, there was a conscious effort to be inclusive 
with a number of all party working groups and regular member briefings, far more than I've ever experienced during my time in opposition. As leader, I've reached out to other parties in order to have constructive dialogue to reach agreements, and that's something that needs to continue to be fostered going forward. Despite having good relationships between officers and members, it's clear there's significantly more work to do in order to have a collective responsibility and more effective decision making across the Council. Council elections are coming up in May, and that gives us an opportunity to reset with some new members coming in and the potential for a more collegiate way of working going forward, as difficult positions will not have gone away. But we also have a huge opportunity to deliver on key projects such as a growth deal. These are essential for our communities. It's important that we build a financial stable, financially stable council that has a robust business plan supported by that transformational programme that will meet the demands of the future, building capacity for future investment to enable us to do what we want to do to support our communities as the next few years of recovery following the pandemic will continue to be challenging. Engaging and feedback that have come from the process um, has, has given us the opportunity to make a conscious decision to change. And particularly one of those um, changes was the relationship with our communities to engage more to find out what's important to them and what they want the council to deliver. Our communities team have started to make significant inroads and the pandemic has made us all more open to that change. And that is recognised in the Best Value report. Empowering our communities is something that we should embrace more as it will help to build a more trusting relationship and foster greater partnerships enable us to deliver better services and meet our obligations around um, our community empowerment. Again, some of the other positives that are highlighted in the report is, is um, around performance. And we know we need to keep improving our approach to performance management and what we report and how we report it. There has been positive steps made through the web pages of, of Falkirk reforms, but more needs to be done. Another significant positive area um, that we cited in the report is a, the work that we did in the response to the pandemic, particularly our support for people. And that, again, that helps to foster that change in relationships with our communities. But pace of change and delivering community empowerment is something that is obviously key. In addressing um, the comments uh, around Falkirk Community Trust within the Best Value report, um, it should be noted that it's not critical of the Council's decision on the trust makes the point that having made that decision, the Council now needs to be prepared to take the necessary decisions about the services that are being transferred. Since the Council took the decision to bring the Trust back in uh, to the Council, there has been a huge amount of positive and instructive work undertaken by both the Council and the Trust staff to prepare for the transfer, and discussions have been ongoing with Trust staff to welcome them into the Council. As the Trust Services will be integrated into the Council Services, it is important to look at the Trust Services again as they are integrated into the Council and what savings may be, made, be able to be made in the wider context of the integrated services and not that of the Trust alone. The Best Value Report has highlighted that we need to do that. We do not yet know the outcome of that exercise, but the outcome of that will be put forward to members for decision in the new Council. Community planning partnership, partnership um, working with our partners is, is, is critical and um, we have reviewed the, the way we work with our partners and we have developed the Falkirk plan. It is a hugely positive plan and one that um, is signed up by all members and is a subject to an <coughs> agenda report. And while the locality plans have not yet to be published, and that is one of the criticisms, there was time distinctly made to pause to refresh those as a result of the, the work that's been done throughout the pandemic to ensure that they were still relevant. And it's right that we take that time to review them in order that the key actions and outcomes remain relevant for our communities. The Integrated Joint Board has made significant progress in key areas um, and just, dry, just prior to the initial lockdown and despite being in response mode, have continued to transform and redesign services at a time when things are very pressured, and that is to be commended. The action plan sets out a route map to address the areas highlighted in the Best Value Audit report that we need to do better. We know what we need to do to be successful, members, but members and officers will need to work together to ensure that a timely, well-informed decisions can be taken. We should not underestimate the, ch the, ch the challenges facing us, 
in these areas, but it's essential that we move forward as one council. I would therefore commend the action plan to members and um, look forward to working in a more collaborative council going forward that will be able to deliver the best possible um, services for our, our communities and deliver um, the, everything that they need to make them sustainable for the future. Thank you, Provost. Okay, thank you. Um, have you got a seconder for your motion there? Provost Councillor Garner. Okay, thanks, Councillor Garner. I'll go straight to I'll go straight to if he, do yes, I'm just going to say, Provost, I'm not going to repeat yeah. anything that the council leaders said, so I'm yeah. happy to second it, reserving the right. Okay, fine. Thank you, sir. Um, we'll go straight to Councillor uh, Nimmo this morning. Um, ask him if he's got an amendment or like to say anything at this stage. Thank you, Councillor Nimmo. Provost, we don't have a, an amendment, but I do have some comments that I would like to make. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, fine. Okay, we've, we've heard a lot about the fact that we currently have a, a minority SNP administration. Now, whether it's a minority or a majority administration, the responsibility, the leadership responsibility lies with the administration. And that's what's been picked up by the, the Accounts Commission. If you look at 4.7 in the report, the leadership of the Council is severely lacking. Uh, and they've raised serious concerns regarding this. It's a very critical report, and you can't get away from that. They're also saying that they do, the Accounts Commission doesn't have confidence that the Council will meet its projected budget gap of 70 million over the next five years. Now, we've already heard that the Accounts Commission are probably coming back in 2023. So, I'm just wondering what work we're undertaking between now and 2023 to make sure that these comments don't come back and bite us again. We can't afford another five years of inaction, uh, and we need to deal with this now and not leave it any longer. Uh, the other thing that I've, I've got here is in relation to 3.1, and it's the, the impact on the climate change ambitions and targets. Can I maybe get some further information officers regarding this, how this is likely to be affected? I think there's one or two questions here. Um, if you want to come back in, Chief Executive, at this stage. Yes, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I suppose three points. Um, firstly, if you read the full report and the conclusions from it and the findings, um, some of it is quite critical, there's no doubt about that. But it does emphasise the role of all elected members, um, and I think it's important we bear that in mind. So there are, of course, specific responsibilities that sit with the administration, but it does emphasise uh, the role of all um, elected members. In terms of um, the financial gap and the actions to uh, to address that, I mean, there, there's certainly been no shortage of activity. Um, or action, and if you, um, I suppose, just look at the range of um, some very challenging, but the range of savings and options are, are um, in front of the council um, in relation to the budget uh, meeting will take place two times, uh, two, uh, two weeks tomorrow. Um, there is a large number of options which the council has in front of it, and the test from the audit commission's point of view in relation to that will be whether the council does take um, some of these challenging decisions or whether it falls back again on um, the, the reserves that it has. So that is the, uh, the test that um, uh, councils will, um, will face. The report does, um, as I mentioned earlier, say that the, uh, the work done on Council of the Future recently has been positive in terms of uh, moving it forward. Members will see that in the action plan, we have a series of actions in relation to um, the transformation program to make that more effective and dynamic and less bureaucratic, all of these things that we um, that we need to do. So that has been a focus of um, activity for the council in recent years and will remain so because of the, um, the, the scale of challenge and urgency in relation to financial position. And finally, um, Provost, in relation to the uh, paragraph on the climate change 
implications at um, 3.1. The point I'm making there is that the Council does have real and significant ambitions in relation to dealing with climate change. If we are going to fulfil these ambitions, it will require investment, um, significant uh, capital um, investment. And if we're going to be able to do that, then we need first to get to a position where we have a sustainable financial uh, position. So that's what lay behind these uh, particular comments. Thank you. Councillor Nemo, you okay? Yeah, that's fine. Thanks very much, Provost. Okay, I'll go to, there's a few hands up. I'll go to Councillor Kerr first to see if his group has any amendment to the, the recommendations. Uh, no amendments, but I have comments, Provost. Carry on. Uh, I understand that the report states that improvements are needed. And time will tell if these outcomes that have been put in appendix will be delivered. Uh, we talk about an inclusive and collaborative working in, in Falkirk. Uh, at the Falkirk Partnership, the last meeting was the 10th of December 2020. And at that meeting, the elected members who were present and representing the council were Councillor Michael John, Councillor Alexander, Councillor Colley, Councillor Brissett. So how can we be how can we work collaboratively or inclusive if one group is not represented? Uh, collaborative working can only succeed if all groups uh, are open and honest and, and are included in these groups. I, I understand what the audits, audit Commission has said regarding making hard decisions, elected members not making hard decisions. But Provost, these decisions aren't taken lightly. Uh, some, of the, some of the decisions that have been asked to be taken will make devastating consequences for some of the communities. And we keep on talking about communities and engaging with the communities. We can only engage with the communities if we get out into the communities. Uh, and I, I, I take on board uh, that improvements have to be made, Provost. And hopefully, when the new council is elected in May, that that can be a stepping stone for these those changes. But everybody needs to be included in this, and I hope going forward that that will be the case. Provost. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do you want to come back in uh, any of the the Issues raised there, um, Chief Executive. Thank you, Provost. I don't think there were any questions specifically there, but I do yeah. note Councillor Kerr's comments about um, inclusion and, and 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 working together, and, and that that will be very important. To, as Councillor Kerr says, when we go to the new council, we need to um, to think about what changes or improvements we 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 put in place to facilitate that. Okay, thank you. We've got Councillor Black, Councillor Coombs, Councillor Munro, and Councillor Alexander. And could I say at this stage, Councillor Alexander, we know you've had surgery and everybody's delighted to see you back in recovery. So it's Councillor Black first, followed by Councillor Coombs, followed by Councillor Munro, and then Councillor Alexander. Councillor Black. Thank you, Provost. There are two main things that I want to talk about this morning. Uh, one's the role of elected members and the other's the HQ and the Arts Centre. In recent years, we've lost a lot of staff as uh, people have retired and moved on. And alongside their skills, their knowledge and their experience, we've also lost their political awareness. For some staff, this has meant that what, what, councillor, what councillors think is not on their radar and that can have political ramifications. 
councillors are being briefed at the end of the process rather than playing a fuller part in the development of policy. And Colin Moody has recognised this as being an issue. It's been tough sometimes listening to all those briefings, uh, not having, ha having had any input beforehand. Policy development panels were such a positive experience for elected members, officers and stakeholders, and we delivered some really good pieces of work. And this was, uh, this, there was buy-in from everyone, and that went from the start of the process right to the end. And this seems to have got lost in recent years. And I've seen for myself some good collaborative working on the IGB with Councillor Colley, Councillor Michael, John and myself. We were very much a team and worked well together. And Councillor Colley and I have had several conversations with myself as the opposition spokesperson, etc., that were frank and open, and I felt we were both on the same page. When Councillor Reid and I were doing economic development during 2020, the administration took on a board suggestions for helping small businesses in the town centres. And these are just two examples showing that we can work collaboratively when the politics takes a back seat. Going forward after May, we have to do much more of this. We have a new code of conduct for our councillors that, that we, we established just a few weeks ago. We all have to follow the rules regarding respect, etc. And you can't work collaboratively if you only treat each other respectfully. And at a recent executive, I saw Councillor Coons and Councillor Munro not being treated as respectfully as they should be. And they're both hard working councillors. They both do their research and that deserves respect. As a new councillor, I thought I'd be able to, be, to change the old style gladiator style type of politics. Georgie Thompson, Gordon Hughes and several others, we all thought, we all thought the same. But unfortunately, the gladiators won and the adversarial confrontational atmosphere continued and it's not easy to work collaboratively under those circumstances. That has to change. After me, everyone needs to have an equal voice. And also, we need to have conversations with our parties locally to see to, to, to make that change happen. Mona Kalenin at the Scottish Parliament with her period poverty bill and the, the work she's done with addictions uh, services, that cross-party work, that's just examples of what can be done when you work together collaboratively. So the HQ and Arts Centre, I'm not standing again, so I can be frank about this. I won't say as much as I'd like to, but uh, because that's not my style. I'm not talking about officers when I'm talking about this, but I'm talking about leadership. In September 2020, I broke the Labour whip so that a development builders workshop could go ahead. That wasn't done lightly. It was a very difficult decision for me to make. Since then, neither the Chief Exec or the Leader of the Council or anyone else in a position of authority has spoken to me. And after Councillor Reid left, it was per perfectly obvious that plans as they stood were unlikely to go ahead, yet this was allowed to happen. It was a car crash waiting to happen and everyone blundered on regardless. And a compromise should have been reached. It should not have been all or nothing from anyone involved. This is a lesson that must be learned. There has to be compromise from everyone. And I've worked with a lot of very hard working, dedicated, enthusiastic officers of, over the years. Stuart Ritchie, Fiona Campbell, Douglas Duff, Mary Pitt-Caithley and Rona Geisler, just as examples. And what they all had in common was that they were not afraid to challenge publicly or privately. You knew where you stood and you knew if you overstepped the mark or hadn't passed muster, you were told about it. And that is the type of frank exchanges that office, senior officers and councillors should be having. It's normal to have those conversations usually privately, but occasionally they'll have to be done publicly. That was that, that was uh, something that was hard to take at times, but over the long term it was much appreciated and I learned a lot from those exchanges. And this has been lost. The separation between senior officers and councillors has become wider. Covid hasn't helped, but relationships have to be built up and respect has to be at the heart of everything that goes forward. Cecily and Kenneth, you are the leaders of this council. The new way of working has to start with the two of you. And, and whoever is the leader after me, we really have to change the way we work. We hoped it would happen 15 years ago, but it didn't. But it has to happen now. Thank you, Provost. Uh, thank you very much for your input there, Councillor Black. And I'm sure that uh, 
some of us will be in despair that you've just told us that you're not going to be standing again. So you've got plenty of time to reconsider because we need experience in, in the council going forward. And the areas that you've covered there, I think most of us would support that. Uh, Mr. Laurie, would you, would you want to come back in anything, or do you want to comment on? Because obviously there was a, quite a a lot of input there for Councillor uh, Councillor Black, and uh, the end of it, she's saying that she's not going to be coming back, but she she she's laying down a marker for those that are going to be here after May to to ensure that the, there will be some sort of collaboration working. Yes, thank you, Provost. Uh, really helpful. Um, comments there, and that absolutely right that that basis of um, respect, mutual um, mm -hmm. respect, the ability to uh, um, talk openly about challenging and difficult issues. These do lie at the heart of collaborative um, working. I I I note the points round about, for example, um, policy development um, uh, panels. Compromise absolutely that does lie at the heart of um, getting things done. And um, just yesterday, um, in discussion with uh, Colin Moody and uh, Karen Algy, recognising that you know quite a number of members are um, uh, leaving, and whether they're leaving or not, it's important that I think at the end of a five-year term that there's an opportunity to feedback. Um, so, we will be um, sharing a questionnaire with all members and we will be giving members the opportunity uh, to meet with with colleagues to talk about what their particular views are and, and concerns are. Because I think that learning is um, really important and it's your um, point, Provost, about, you know, experienced members that have um, important um, things to say in terms of our learning going forward. So. I do appreciate these uh, uh, comments from Councillor Black. Okay, thank you, sir. Councillor Coombs and Councillor Rowan, Councillor Alexander. Councillor Coombs. Provost, um, I, I've tried to contact Alan as our uh, deputy leader this morning to ask if we could have a, a quick recess. There's a couple of points that I'd like to clarify, if possible, with Mr. Smale before I speak, if that's Possible. Well, well, what I'll do is I'll, I'll bring uh, your deputy leader in, uh, <coughs> Councillor Nimmo. You've heard what Councillor Coombs said. Would you want a recess at this particular point? Uh, thanks, Provost. I've just picked up Councillor Coombs' message there in the, the chat. I'd be quite happy with a, a short recess just to discuss matters. Ten minutes, to it. Fine. Ten minutes is fine. Thanks. Okay. Brian, is Brian Smale available? I don't know how we can get him into the remote chat. I'm sure somebody will be able to figure it out. I am on the call, promised. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Michael John and Councillor Kerr, Mr. Perry just asking you want break breakout rooms set up for you for your groups? Councillor Michael John. Yes, please, promised. Okay, fine. So that's um just about eleven o'clock just now. So we'll see you back in ten minutes, hopefully. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there was an opportunity there. I think you got about 15 minutes. So I'm going to go straight back to Councillor Coombs, who asked for this. And uh, have you got any pertinent questions? Thank you, uh, Provost, and thanks very much for your indulgence. I appreciate we took more than 10 minutes, but I do think yeah. it's an important report. Um, one of my first questions is, do we have auditors on the call? Yes, well, I believe I believe that we have we have um, somebody from EY here, uh, Stephen Reid, and we, we, is your question going to be directed to Mr. Reid? Well, I have a couple of questions with regard to the audit report, which I think is very closely linked, obviously, to to best value. Um, but I, I'll I'll start off with the best value report, and then go on to the others. Um, the Four point seven on today's report, where the accounts commission and I don't know if there's anybody from Audit Scotland here, um, is saying that they are extremely disappointed that the current report yet again finds insufficient progress is being made by the council in its um, improvements. Uh, 
and I said already at the nine, January 19th meeting that I, it, it was a, a damning report. I think that it said there's also positive working relations between elected members and officers. Sorry. The positive da, 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 between uh, elected members and officers. However, there's insufficient progress being made by the council in its improvement. That they have no, sorry, there's the line. There was positive working relationships between elected members and officers, but they were con seriously concerned that they don't see the collaborative leadership required to deliver the change that's needed. They have no confidence, sorry, they, they cannot yet, I don't want to misquote, they cannot yet have confidence that the council will meet a projected budget gap over 70 million pounds over the next five years. Now, I wondered if it may not be EY, it may be the Accounts Commission that I need to ask about what they think that we should be doing that we're not doing. I know that, as I said, leadership has been criticised here. Um, and I think that going forward, we really need to get down to the guts of this rather than just passing it as a report from nothing personal. But, you know, this, this is an accountant's report. Leave the finances to the financial people. I think this is crucial to the running of the council. And it needs okay. to be looked at. Well, 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 I think Mr. Reid, are you on the call? Yes, I am, Provost. Um, you've heard the question there. Um, do you want to, to take this question on board and try and give us an answer? Uh, well, Provost, I'm, I'm very happy to, to provide some commentary uh, and apologies. I'm staying off video because I'm having terrible connection problems uh, this morning. No problem. Uh, uh, clearly, the uh, best value assurance report was completed by a joint team from Audit Scotland and uh, from uh, EEY uh, in line with the uh, requirements uh, and the code of audit practice. Now, the BVAR report is much more than an accountant's report. It seems uh, it evaluates the Council's progress in delivering its statutory responsibilities that are placed on all members. Uh, just to underline that point, that it's all members' responsibility uh, to secure best value in the delivery of the Council's uh, services. Uh, and the uh, action plan which uh, officers uh, have developed and is before the Council today, it's not my role, Provost, to comment on uh, what the Council needs to do. The findings are within the report and it's uh, for officers and members working together to develop, uh, execute and monitor the execution with the required degree of pace and urgency uh, with, that is reflected within the commentary, both within the report and from uh, the Accounts Commission. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Now, do you want to go then back to the Chief Executive in relation to your question, Councillor Coombs? You've heard from uh, Stephen Reid. What, what, yeah, I, I would, um, Provost, and I think Given the comments, and I understand um, what Stephen's saying there, I think my specific question then to Mr. Laurie would be, um, given the disappointment that the Commission had uh, about not making the required improvements since the last audit, what can we learn from other councils if it's I mean, what characteristics do these councils have in leadership that we don't? Because that seems to okay. be the crux of this. Yeah, that seems clear enough. Mr. Laurie, would you like to come in here, sir? Yes, um, thank you. And perhaps, firstly, um, just in relation to a, you know an, an earlier comment that Councillor Coombs made, and my apologies, I misinterpreted this, but you know the, the comment was quite rightly that you know, we, it's not just a report to pass and 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 move on. It's it's really important we do something about that. And that's of course precisely what the action plan is there to do. And as um uh, Mr. Reed has said, it's about developing the action plan, executing the action plan, and monitoring the fact that we have 
have done that, and that is the um, the key to moving forward. Uh, in, in in terms of um, you know what what needs to change? What is what is it about other councils that has that makes a difference? I mean, I suppose my view is in many ways not that much, but it is about decisions being taken, and I think we have. Um, and it, this reflects a comment that the, the leader made earlier. We are somewhat behind the curve in various aspects of our transformation. I mean, I would particularly cite our approach, for example, to property and, and facilities where we haven't taken significant decisions to invest and rationalize. That is simply one example, but I think more generally across the transformation program while well, some really good work has been done and that is recognized if you look at the detail um of the report and we've got um now i think a good degree of um member engagement in that um it's it's simply that we're behind the curve and because of that our financial position is particularly acute and unless or until we get to a sustainable financial position we won't then be able to make the changes, the investments in our community, which are particularly important as we emerge from uh, COVID and all the challenges that that has brought um, for our communities in terms of inequalities and um, disadvantage. So um, I don't think it's that we're any less capable than any other authority of dealing with the things that need to be done, but that we are behind the curve and the report is telling us that, and the action plan is what we need to implement to move ahead with that. Thank you, Provost. Okay, thank you. Councillor Coombs, back to you. Any further questions? <laughs> You're on mute, Councillor Coombs. Sorry. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll do it. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Stephen from EY about a couple of the, the comments that were made in the audit report, if that's possible. Um, as I say, these were the questions that I was hoping to get clarified in January. Um, on page 173 of the audit report, it says um, there were concerns about the support of fraud investigation at chief officer level. And at the end of that paragraph, it says that requests from EY forensics. You're back in mute, Councillor Coombs, sorry. Sorry, uh, the papers must have hit the button. Um, the, the, the request from EY Forensics to conduct interviews took an unusual length of time to convene. I just wonder if EY could tell me, it, it's, it's concerning that they didn't feel that they had the level of support um, at chief officer level. Could EY elaborate on that or clarify what exactly the situation was there? Mr. Reid, back to you. Thank you, Provost. Thank you, Councillor. Um, you, you have me at a disadvantage because I, I don't carry the Falkirk Annual Audit Report around with me, so I don't have it in front of me today. But, but, but I do remember uh, the references uh, within the report. Uh, and, and I would probably, uh, again, uh, suggest that it's a question more for senior officers. Uh, but as the report says, we did experience un unusual delays in uh, uh, being able to uh, undertake the necessary interviews to allow us to complete our work and to conclude on that work. Uh, clearly, there, is, uh, there were at the time uh, as we were com completing the work and provided with the information, particular resourcing challenges within the counter fraud team. Uh, and those uh, did uh, contribute uh, to the level of work that we did have to uh, undertake uh, as part of the annual audit process. Uh, but in terms of the broader question, I'd suggest it's one for officers to respond to. Okay. Um, I, again, from this report, uh, I, I think it's important to highlight the fact that you, as auditors, um, were concerned that the number of red flags that were highlighted by Audit Scotland within its report 
um, remain present within the service. And with this and, and my previous question, um, on an average basis, th th these statements to me seem, as I said, quite damning, very harsh and, and very critical of the council. Not something that I'm aware of, certainly not that Falkirk Council have had in, in the 10 years that I've been here. And I wonder, on a level of, of critical comments, how serious are they? Is this something that's, that, that are dropped into many councils' reports, or is this at the, the edge of really red flags and this needs to be sorted quickly? Mr Reid. Thank you. Uh, I can confirm these are not comments which we, as standard, uh, put into all audit reports. Uh, they were spe specific comments based on uh, the work uh, that we were required to undertake. Uh, this year, and if members also recall, uh, there was particular uh, whistleblowing allegations last year, uh, where we undertook uh, additional work, uh, made a number of recommendations uh, for uh, improvements uh, to be made, and there has been progress uh, made there. Uh, but again, this year we were required to undertake additional work uh, in relation to allegations uh, and whistleblowing allegations uh, that had been made, uh, and uh, you know the criticisms that are in the report. Uh, are, are made to bring those matters to the attention of members, uh, but also to ensure that officers remain focused uh, on uh, the, the important improvement actions that are required in those areas. Okay, thanks, thanks. Yeah. thanks for that. Um, I don't think there's a meeting gone past in the last 10 years where I haven't mentioned zero-based budgeting. And I know in the report that it says that the cross-cutting projects being limited to transport um, also seems to be uh, a missed opportunity for uh, to improve the, the situation within our financial uh, behaviours or procedures, whatever. Um, I understand that the officers have been nominated to the, the nine recommendations within the the report but as as we have discussed our chief officers are, are in a state of flux um i wonder if the uh, kenneth could perhaps uh, basically has there a risk assessment been done on this 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 is a huge report these these are not good news stories both the the audit commission and the base value report and Yes, we've nominated officers um, to look at them, but our senior officers, as I said, um, we're, we're, we're losing and gaining people at the top. How likely is this that these issues are going to be addressed within a, a, a reasonable time frame? Mr Laurie. Um, my, my, my personal view, Provost, is we have no, uh, we have no choice but to address them. Um, um, rapidly i don't think we can um receive um a best value report um which calls for urgent action on the number of recommendations and not um move quickly on that and in terms of um developing the action plan and assigning leadership roles to the action plan i mean that is something we've done collaboratively and openly and people have stepped forward uh, to take on roles because they want to make uh, changes and make um, change happen. And whilst we have taken that approach of very clear accountability through a lead um, officer for each of the recommendations, um, they have colleagues behind them and working with them. They've got the program, uh, the PMO, that deals with Council of the Future. So um, they're not working alone. This is about a coordinated resourced endeavour to deal with the, the challenges that are set out in the um, in the best value report. Okay. I'm not sure that that gives me much comfort. Uh, as you say, there, there's no choice, but it leaves the council in a very, maybe not vulnerable, but certainly a very risky situation. Um, 
as I say, with no with no clear time frame as as to when these improvements will be made. The uh, back to the the report that we we have before us today. The the themes that are being focused on, obviously, number one is leadership, um, and the, the the other one that people will not be surprised that I'm bringing up again is the 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 Falkirk Community Trust. Um, I mentioned this at last week's executive. I think that again, the auditors and and best value has not been given to our residents over the decision made by council regarding the trust. Already a, a million lost in rates, and we're asking for a million pounds of savings, which just brings us to break even. And um, the I, I wrote to the council leader last week and said, without any shadow of doubt, we all know, we know, officers know, and their residents know that you cannot take a million pounds well, two million pounds um, away from a service without closures. Staff are our biggest expenditure, and I think it's time that we were a bit more open and transparent. It's all very well involving our, our residents and asking them what they think, but we need to tell them what's at risk here. And I think that kicking it the can down the road until after the election and just keeping it all very vague and woolly is it's reprehensible and and i think it, it's being dishonest to the people out there that we serve and whose facilities will undoubtedly be getting closed to try and save some of this money thanks Robert. thank you uh, thank you very much now just to clarify where we are we've got a number of people that still want to come in we have a, a motion moved and seconded um there's no amendment so it's questions only we have Councillor Monroe, Councillor Alexander, Councillor McClucky, Councillor Murta, and Councillor Garner before we go back to uh, Councillor Nicole John. So, Councillor Monroe, and remember, it's questions only to either the um, representative of um, EY or our, our officers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Provost. Um, Councillor Hardak to follow the the, the comments made by Alison and, and Joan, but I think what they're saying very clearly is that we need to be rigorous in, uh, in looking at the report before us because we all of us find we learn more through our mistakes than sometimes just carrying on regardless. And this report points out very clearly the importance of council showing how it acts to do more to support people's experiences and satisfaction with council services and it references both the planning partnership and the ijb as key elements on this journey but and I'd, 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 and i think we've got to ask this question again how do we get the constructive working we seek when not one of the seven conservative councillors are represented on either of these committees and that's my first question Okay, then who would like to come in on that? Uh, Mr. Laurie, would you like to come in on that one? It's a simple one. I think Councillor Kerr brought that up initially that, regarding the lack of representation. Um, yes, that's right, um, Provost. Thank you. And I think it, in response to Councillor Kerr, I said that, and there were a range of, 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 of comments, to be fair that, fair, that had been made. I said that clearly that was something that we needed to give. Um, consideration to and it's a matter for council ultimately um and council will will no doubt make decisions in the context of trying to create that collaborative leadership which uh, uh, doesn't currently exist but i i absolutely understand the point that's been made thank you any other questions councilman row yes um the strategic action plan makes clear in actions under item one on page nine how much work and training needs to take place to change the culture of the council for both councillors and officers. Overall, the plan gives a framework on making change, but provides little in the way of specifics. How and what we intend to do. A priority should be to ensure that councillors are represented on all committees and our role as the voice of our community is represented too. And there is an acceptance 
or ought to be an acceptance that councillors are an important link in ensuring that the voice of the community is, is heard. The, the points raised in items two, three and four are all keen financial management changes which best value makes clear are key elements in making the transformation necessary. A business plan which is outcome focused and delivers new, cheaper ways of doing our job and from which no area of the council ought to be excluded or excused. And we have to be both critical of past performance and keen to pinch the best ideas from elsewhere. Otherwise, we are stuck with a shrinking pot of money and we fail to do anything to improve the standard we want for our communities. The capital programme demonstrates more than anything the competing demands for cash for new projects, cash we don't have. And I hope that we have a rigorous programme as soon as possible to review projects and determine those which are community priorities. Over and over, Best Value reinforces the points that management and reporting of projects is key. We are clearly not being sufficiently open enough as a council and, and as councillors, we're continually asked to make decisions without the necessary information. We need to have the whole process from planning to completion open to scrutiny of, of all our projects and be able to see a project has met its specific goals. I know we're on this road, but at the moment it seems a very slow road and, and I, I feel that uh, as previous speakers that more needs to be done more quickly in, in order to, to tackle the, 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 the issues ar around our finance and, and um, the question I have is, is, you know, we have a framework, but, you know, where are the specific actions that we need in order to make okay. these changes? Okay, thank you. There's Come back to you, Mr. Laurie. There's a lot of substance in what um, Councilman Rose said there. We have a few questions in it, but the, the, you heard the, the, the latterly the main the main thrust. Yes, thank you, um, Provost. I mean, uh, um, a, a lot of um, comments here. And absolutely note um, uh, these in terms of how we um, uh, move forward. In terms of the, uh, and th th these are the actions as we have set them out at this stage in relation to the um the actions the, the, the recommendations in the report and um, the officers who are leading each of these themes have developed these actions we're working with teams to get the detail that's underneath that and to work through the implications of that some of that is already um well underway um, but our in terms of reporting back to Council of the Future Board um, and to um, committees. This will be our basic framework, but there will be information behind that, uh, which we can bring forward, forward and which members will be able to, to scrutinise. And, and I, I suppose in relation to um, the comment that you know, more needs to be done and, and more quickly, well, I mean, absolutely, this is what this is um, about. This is the intent behind the action plan. This is what we're endeavouring to achieve and the fact that um, elected members I think broadly speaking are are um, aligning themselves with that and saying that they also want to increase that pace of change uh, will be very helpful and very positive promise thank you very much thank you councillor for your input councillor alexander and we're at questions only at this stage thank you very much your mute councillor alexander Councillor Alexander, are you still mute, sir? Right there. I can hear you now, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, first of all, thank you for your kind comments at the start of the meeting today, Provost. Uh, not just for the, the comments that were made, but also for standing in for me uh, during the, the planning process uh, for quite a a few applications and quite a few agendas. And I'm very grateful to you for that. Thank you. I think it's a good example of collaborative working 
Yeah. Yeah. This is a water and you know, I've got a couple of questions. This is a water is first of all the focus a partnership. My understanding thinking back, initially John Patrick was part of that planning partnership, uh, as was Nigel Harris. Uh, and the uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. Put my hands up and say if I'm wrong. The uh, issue of uh, what constitutes a legitimate debate vis a vis what constitutes uh, 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 basically an administration or an opposition uh, acting on its own behalf. And unfortunately, we've seen too much of the latter part. Latter. Uh, the, uh, which is to see and maybe bring Brian could bring me to a, a, a paper maybe with regards to how much has been moved where we have opposition for opposition sake, how much has been moved uh, by opposition groups uh, at budget at uh, whatever at the uh, you know, reports when when uh, are coming up and that they are part of the financial package, the overall financial package or the pencil. Like many others, I'm not coming back next year. Uh, the uh, I think uh, it's a uh, it's time to for fresh blood, and uh, I wish you all very well in terms of the uh, ability to deliver that. Well, as a fairly one party, uh, as you would expect. The uh, I'm not surprised that we we have got reports which are, are not quite. Uh, what we vote for. I uh, commend, commend the members of the, when the last received a positive report from the, the uh, from the others. I uh, know it's the best value. I think it was 2008. And uh, it spoke about the relationship between myself and the big key the chief executive. Uh, the, uh, I leave it at that promise. There's, there's a lot of I've jotted down here about double standards and, and the, 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 the all groups to, 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 to do in this area. Uh, the particular in relation to the very uh, common sense when it comes to budgetary issues and we're trying to balance the books and uh, prepare for the future. Uh, yet yeah, it seems to be that uh, we're some groups anyway. It's a current present is an important thing. So, uh, can you find a couple of questions in there, Carlos? Yep. Um. We'll maybe go to Mr. Laurie. Mr. Laurie, you picked up any questions there direct to your good self, uh, Councillor Alexander? Um. Thank you, um, Provost. I mean, I have to say I'm not entirely familiar with who, um which parties have been represented on the planning partnership at different um, times. But as I, I've, I've said previously, I, that, that is a matter which the council can um, revisit and, and can choose to revisit after the um, election. I think the, uh, the point being made about, you know, all members having a role is a, an exceptionally um, important um, one. And um, you know, in a sense, that is a, that is a starting point for um, collaborative leadership. If members are collectively um, prepared to accept that there is a joint endeavour here in terms of making the kind of changes um, that need to be made, um, albeit there'll be significant challenges um, in that province. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much for your input, Councillor Alexander. Councillor McClucky, and remember, it's questions only at this time, sir. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Thanks, Provost, as always. Uh, it's always interesting, these Fokker plans. Uh, I've been a Labour councillor 15 years, and uh, I'm, well, I'll not be a, a Labour councillor after this year. Um, but um, as I say, it's a very, the, what happens is we come up with them because the lashing didn't work. The, one, the, the previous ones are always ones to resolve the previous ones and what we've got in front of us today is another document that we hope deals with issues that didn't 
the election was going to resolve. So um, the questions as I've got here is, um, I'll give you an example of things. We talk about collaborative work and resolve many issues. We talk about council of the future. And the first question would be, what future? Right um, to the, obviously, Mr. Laurie. Um, that's one question. We'll take, we'll take them one at a time, Councillor right, McCutty, no, so we don't no, get mixed up. No Council, problem. Mr. Laurie, you heard the question, Councillor of the Future, maybe you could expand on that. Thank you, um, uh, Provost. I mean, the, the Council of the Future approach is a mechanism to make changes within the Council to get us into a, a more uh, financially sustainable position to improve um, services and to engage better with the communities. The series of projects there and members are are well aware from reports that have come forward over recent months that whilst we haven't achieved all that we would wish to achieve, there have been significant changes, there have been significant um, improvements and have been positive results from that um, program. The the report does acknowledge um, that in terms of the improvements in the recent period as well, the audit report. Um, so what we need is not um, anything other than an acceleration um, of that. So the, 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 the work is important work, it needs to continue, but we need to do it um, better and quicker is what the, um, uh, the audit report is telling us. Thank you, Provost. Right, thanks uh, uh, for that. Obviously, what you said in previous reports was the council would be a third smaller, so it's just very hard to imagine that we can be better when we're a third less officers and, and, and capabilities. But I, I take your response for that. Um, the next one is a very other very important issue um, for the Falkirk plan is dealing with the uh, climate change. And when we look at the, the budget proposals, there's nothing in the capital spend to deal with electric vehicles, to sort buildings, to you know deal with um, issues to deal with climate change because we didn't hear the money in the climate change. So how are we going to address the major climate issues of the future if we have no capital or investment or budgets to to address it? That's my next question. Right. Could you just clarify, Councillor McCorkey, with your questions in relation to the, the best value or the Falkirk Plan 2020? Falkirk Plan, as I well, say. Is, is... Well, that's the, next, that's the next item, John. All right, okay, right. No bother, I'm, I'll, I'll hold my, de hold my, my things to that. You know? Okay, right, thank you very much. Now, it's we've got a, a, a number still waiting to speak. We've got Councillor Murta, Councillor Gardner, and Councillor Hughes, before we go back to the leader. Councillor Murta, thank you. Uh, sorry, Provost, I, I, I am uh, having some technical difficulties. Could I defer to one of my colleagues at the moment, as uh, I believe there's just about to be some drilling commencing behind me at this stage. Okay, thank you. Then we'll, we'll go to Councillor Gardner. He had an opportunity to come back after seconding. Councillor Gardner. Thank you, Provost. And hearing what all uh, some of the elected members are saying here, and they're talking about it's in the report and about collabor collaborative leadership and uh, all member responsibilities. And it is all member responsibilities, and everybody here is a leader, and everybody here is part of this leadership that Falkirk Council has. Uh, collaboration takes at least two parties uh, to, to make a collaborative approach, and that's that's what, what's, uh, what can be difficult at times. From day one, when we stepped into administration, the door was open and we did, we did have meetings right from day one, trying to work on how we can do things best for Falkirk going forward. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case at the time, uh, and but we did move on. We've, we've continued to try and work with opposition members, and, and I know a few members here will be, will be agreeing with me there, whether they would like to nod their head or not, I don't know. And we continue to do that, and we continue to try and be inclusive as much as possible. Uh, as a minority administration, we need support of other groups. And uh, we don't want, as, as Council Alexander says, just opposition politics for opposition's sake, but which we come up against uh, quite a lot. Uh, there will be a new cohort of elected members coming in in May the 5th. And I'm really hoping that'll be, be a new dawn for Falkirk Council. 
And the question I've got for Mr. Laurie, does he agree with me that the council leader and indeed his door are always open? Simple question, Mr. Laurie. Well, it's, 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 it's perhaps for me to comment on my own um, openness and um, availability, only to observe in, 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 in passing that, you know, I've managed to work, I think, collaboratively and well with the, the council leader, but also with the leaders of the other um, two groups. And that's always been the approach I've tried um, to take. In terms of um, my own kind of openness, I'd like to think that that is what um, the approach I take. It's always been um, my preferred approach, something which is very open, something which is not um, hierarchical or stuffy or bureaucratic. So I don't think any of these things serve us well. We need an open and positive and engaged um, culture, uh, a comment that various members have made. We need to learn from the front line um, and we need to enable people right across the organisation to contribute and to make a difference. And that is the kind of culture which I have endeavoured um, to create within the council. I think the point was made earlier that some of that has been more difficult in the context of COVID. And I think that's undoubtedly um, the case. But as we emerge from COVID, I, I do think there's a, a, an opportunity to, to you know, really revitalize that approach, that, that openness, that engagement, that um, involvement of all. And that, that is always the culture I've endeavored to uh, pursue myself. Okay, thank you, Mr. Laurie. Thank you, Councillor Garner, for your input there. Councillor Hughes, any questions? You're on mute, Gordon. Apologies, Provost. I can hear you fine. You're back mute, Gordon. Sorry, right. That was my fault there, Provost, but apologies for that. I have a couple of observations first because, and, and round about the nature of collaboration. And then I have a couple of questions um, for Mr. Reid, the auditor, if that is in, in order. It is in order. Thank you. I just wanted to follow on from what Councillor uh, Gardner was saying in terms of collaboration. May I remind um, Council that when the, the SNP administration took over, the then leader of the Conservative group brought forward a motion um, which changed the dynamics and nature of decision-making within the council. And that was in relation to the executive. At that time, the cabinet approach under the previous administration uh, was 9-3 on the executive. And, and the Conservative leader at that um, who proposed the, the, the changes in relation to the executive felt that because of the unique nature of Falkirk Council, the, the, the dynamics in terms of the three political parties, that all political parties, in fact, should be part of the decision-making process and, and have greater involvement. Now, that's... that's uh, it's perfectly um, acceptable when you think about it. Uh, and my point slightly to the deputy leader of the Labour group, um, when he was mentioning that leadership um, basically rests with the administration. But in fact, when you change the dynamics or structure of decision making the, into a more pluralistic, if I put it that way, decision making process, then we all have, um, shall we say, in decision making and old fashioned leadership is really something that we should be getting away from. And my questions in relation to uh, the auditors, is there, first of all, um, an optimum in relation to when you talk about collaborative leadership, what um, would you say are the key facets or importance around collaborative leadership? And my second question is... Gordon, we'll, we'll take them one at a time. Oh, sorry, 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 Provost. Mr. No, no, Mr. Reid, you've heard the question for Councillor Hughes. Thank you, uh, Provost. Thank you, uh, Councillor. 
I guess I would respond to the question by noting uh, that there is no one style, you know, no one approach fits all, uh, but collaborative leadership, uh, many of the facets, in my personal opinion, have been recognised by various members uh, during the discussion today. That has to be about transparency, communication, uh, respect, uh, and that desire to work uh, together. Uh, as the uh, Chief Executive pointed out earlier, the uh, Council uh, will face uh, discussions on the budget uh, in a little over uh, two weeks' time. Uh, and the scale of the financial challenge uh, facing uh, the Council is significant. And perhaps the meeting in, the, in, in a few weeks' time is the first opportunity uh, for members on the back of the Best Value Report to demonstrate that collaborative leadership uh, through making some very difficult uh, decisions, and I don't underestimate how difficult those decisions are, uh, to move the Council to a position of financial sustainability uh, rather than uh, seeking to balance uh, the budget on an annual basis uh, and uh, relying on fiscal flexibilities and the use of reserves, uh, as has been uh, and as is the case at the current time. Okay, next question, Gordon. Yes, I uh, just one more question. Um, obviously, strategic thinking um, is the, the optimum in terms of decision making. Um, in relation to strategic thinking, local government has vacillated between committee structures and cabinet structures for the last 20, well, last 15 years, I would think. And in your opinion, Mr. Reid, when looking at the structure of local government or councils in general, would you recommend or do you think that the structure plays an important part in developing collaborative leadership? Mr. Reid. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor, for that question. Uh, I think, as you've noted, you know, over the years and uh, across Scotland and the rest of the UK, the approach to the structure of authorities has changed uh, between authorities and within authorities. Uh, and there is no, in my opinion, one model uh, which uh, delivers better than another. Uh, I think what is very important is that whichever model on the policy that's adopted by that authority, whichever model uh, that is adopted, uh, is uh, th that is used to the best effect uh, to deliver the agenda and through members working uh, together uh, for the benefit of uh, the residents and the communities. Great. Thank you, Mr. Reid. Thank you, Provost. Thank you, Councillor Murta. We've got you back. Thanks, Provost. I now have power as well, so hopefully I won't, uh, you know, uh, keep coming off the call. Um, I think it's very difficult and coming off the back of what my, my colleagues have said and, and what I wanted to ask was, was really around uh, some, some things which uh, Councillor Hughes has just pointed out, is that in terms of culture, um, about the structures, there's also got to, to match up with culture as well. Um, I think um, being from a, a kind of dual national background, knowing that there are, there are different political systems in different places and they work. Um, one of the reasons that I remember growing up and hearing why PR couldn't work and minority administrations couldn't work in this country is that we didn't have the political culture to match it. And so I think that it, it's in the, the comments of the auditor there, it, it does take a commitment of understanding what culture, what structure you're in, what culture is needed. And to pick up on what Councillor Black, I think, was saying earlier is that, unfortunately, we don't have these two things which which match up the the culture which we've got the adversarial um winner takes all politics is everything culture which still seems to pervade um in a, in a perhaps a, a minority i don't know of, of uh, members but there is a that culture which which has i think stifled the progress so my question is really around given that we we acknowledged partly i think that very thing in, in the, the motion which we unanimously agreed um in in December, um, which looked at the need for a greater respect and collaboration amongst councillors going forward, um, is how do we marry those two um, and what proposals could be put forward for um, changing structures, given that if it was an experiment, 
even a well-meaning experiment in terms of changing the executive structure, it clearly didn't work. It clearly led to a situation um, which stifled the progress and the transformational change which is needed in the council and stopped the administration from leading. Um, so I suppose my first question really would be to, to the chief executive is that um, what can what more can officers do? I know there's the, the plan, um, but to lead the cultural transformation um, which is which is badly needed um, and, and facilitate it better. Um, in order that um, we can, can make progress for the, the citizens of Falkirk. Mr. Bore, you have that? <clears throat> Thank you, um, Provost. Um, in, in terms of changing culture, I guess there's um, th there's a couple of things. Part of it is the um, the support we provide, the, the um, opportunities through induction, the people we bring in to speak to you, the conversations we um, facilitate. Um, we can do all of that. And you see a number of actions set out in the um, in the action plan. And and you know I would hope. Um, well, I suppose firstly, I, I you know agreeing with the comment that um, Stephen Reid made about actually there's opportunities to start doing this now for councillors. So um, there's there's a, a budget in two weeks' time. You know, what um, uh, collaborative uh, working are we going to see in relation to that? But. <clears throat> In the context of induction of the new council, open conversations about how we work together to achieve the things um, that need to be achieved. And as officers, because of the criticality of this, you know, we will work with members to take this wherever we can take it forward in a in a positive way. I think we're really open um, to that and really clear about the fact that we want to um, facilitate and, and support it. And I think the point that you make, councillor. Murta about um, you know the, the the structure is 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 one thing, but actually it's the culture, it's people's willingness to engage, be part of that, perhaps change behaviours um, and approaches. All of these things um, are, I think, more important than the structure itself. Because if you look across the country, there's different structures, different approaches, and they can all be made um, to work. So. Um, that would be my response on that point, uh, Provost. So Thank you. I, I think that, and, th and this is where I want to, to kind of elaborate with some observations to fall into question, because how, my question is really how can this situation change? So as a portfolio holder, I don't sit on the executive of the council. I cannot bring forward um, my own proposal. I can't move proposals in which are in my portfolio area in the main executive area and, and, and would have to ask colleagues to do so. Now, if, if there was a different culture and collaboration worked and you knew that the, the, develop, the, the proposals that you were working on with your officers and very detailed and, and just what was you know, being said by opposition members about you know, leading the way um, as councillors and, and bringing those things forward, if you knew that you could, in fact, uh, because of collaboration in the atmosphere uh, and culture in the executive, know that, that those things would be, would be going through, I think officers would be able to be bolder um, and be able to be more confident about what they could give in terms of, you know, options, um, because they would know with a little bit more certainty uh, the likelihood of of those transformations actually coming to fruition. But not only in, in terms of the executive does the model stifle the the progress of the council and how we can change that. There are very practical things and examples right, you know, right, right at the start of this council, uh, this council term. When the COSLA boards were being, uh, you know, decided and appointed at council, there was a decision um, by opposition members, and I'm not trying to be critical of past decisions. I'm trying to give examples here, where opposition members took up the uh, the positions on those boards. And what that means is, as a portfolio holder, I don't have the benefit of the information of sitting on those boards and discussion with colleagues and development of policies and ideas. And my and my colleagues are the same. And that, because I don't get that, I don't have the briefings, I don't have the understanding, I don't have that opportunity to go forward and take this council forward and play my role in that leadership role as other colleagues um, who are portfolio holders. Sorry, I, I don't know if you're all frozen um, or I'm frozen. No, you're fine. Okay, I, I think yeah. it's just the picture that keeps freezing. I, you're all frozen on my screen, but I'll just keep talking. You can shout at me if, if I've fallen. Um, but effectively, that decision to um, 
Do you know I, mean? I mean, that was a political decision. Let's face it. The political it was a political appointment decision. And that one decision le leads to us not being able to move forward properly as a council to make the best decisions. And there are lots of examples like that. Um, so I, I, I disagree quite vehemently with the points that Councillor Nimmel was making at the start in terms of about it being the administration uh, leadership alone, which is which is the issue. We all collectively, as 30 councillors, share that responsibility. But if it is blocked, if there are blockers in there that prevent us being able to take that forward, that is a huge issue. So there has to be a commitment, not just from whoever's in administration or even whoever's in leadership, whether it's the chief executive of the leader of the council, whose doors I believe are always open, um, that we we don't make decisions like that and we evaluate every decision on that basis. So, I mean, I'm, I'm very much hoping that uh, officers could give some insight into how the reform of, I know there's been attempts to structure standing orders, but how that basically in a new council, and, and yes, we're attempting it from now and um, going forward, can, can point out maybe perhaps more bluntly and maybe perhaps more openly in public how these decisions individual as they are will will impact because I think they've had a real prop a real effect on our ability as an administration on our ability to lead and, and um not be just pulled back at every opportunity because of uh, political um opportunities shall it say um, <coughs> and I think it would be welcome to know um how officers um feel they could input into that process okay thank you uh, mr Laurie there was a lot of Input there for Councillor Murta. I think we've, we've gleaned exactly what the question is there. Um, I have, and uh, I'm quite sure you have. You'd like to respond? Um, yeah, thank you, um, uh, Provost. I'll make a few um, comments. It may be that um, uh, Colin Moody would also like to um, contribute on this, but I'll um, uh, speak first. So the Council will take um, decisions on its future. Um, arrangements after the election, both in terms of decision making and in terms of um, the kind of representation you were talking about there, Councillor Murta. Now, one might hope, given that um, you know we're all talking about the importance of collaborative leadership and working together and a joined up approach, that flowing from the these kind of open discussions I'm talking about in the period after the election. That we, we would be able as a council, or you would be able as a council, to come to a collaborative, um, collective view as to what would work well for the council in the context of whatever outcomes the election might um, throw up. So there's an opportunity there for the council to decide how it wishes to run itself over um, the next period. And as I say, if there's a genuine commitment to trying to uh, work collaboratively and collectively and transparent, transparently together. That may lead to a, a, a positive shared um, outcome. Uh, though again, people may legitimately have um, may legitimately have different views as to what constitutes the best um, approach. So I don't need to say that as a kind of proviso to my earlier comment. Thank you, Provost. I suppose my, my final this blunt question is in chances of success if any one group or you know collective of yeah. councillors decide to basically use this as an opportunity to say, well, it's not our fault, it's all it's all their fault. Is there not an absolute requirement in this report? And I suppose it's to the auditor as well, is there not an absolute requirement that none of us do that and say, you know what, there is there is collective responsibility. And any one collective of us, given that it is a minority situation that we are currently in, doing that will lead to further um, lack of progress and, and won't enable the action plan to be a success. Do you want to come back in, Mr. Laurie? We want to bring Mr. Moody in at this stage. Um, Provost, um, all I would say is that absolutely there is a, um, a shared and collaborative um responsibility so in, in in terms of the decisions um made by the the the, the council if there's a, co a collective recognition of that and a collective wish to 
um, make the kinds of changes which this report points us to very strongly, then you know it, it, it then sits within members' hands to uh, to ensure that such decisions are made. Okay, then. Okay, thank you very much then for your input. We we'll have uh, Councillor McCocky, you get your hand up again. You've, you've asked questions. Are we asking questions again? You, you've got an opportunity. We're, we're asking questions about the right report this time, can we? Fine. Right, right. Obviously, it's about collaborative working. My view is that the executive system doesn't work, and we obviously passed that as a council at the time, thinking it was a good way of working. I believe that uh, the old part of the old system was the best. When you spoke about housing, you had all this people relating to housing at that meeting. It was better scrutiny, better discussion, better decisions. You had an environment meeting, you had an economic meeting, you had a you had a housing meeting. They were very vocal but very um well received. And as I say, it certainly was the best way of scrutinising, discussing and taking things forward collectively. And many of the times it was all agreed. The difference was that when I think, and I must ask and how it can be looked at by the, this question to the, obviously, um, the, the, the Mr. Uh, <laughs> I, for, I forgot the, the obviously, the thing. The, what I'm going to say is the difference is when we went and we had a split at these committees, we went to P&R and then we ended up discussing it at PNR and then it went again and went to full council when the reality was PNR could have been missed out and straight to the council if there was a split and a disagreement with some. PNR at that time was for budgets and we didn't get involved in the budget debates. Executive has ended up dealing with all the budget issues and wasn't it in place before to do we I wasn't set out to do some of the major decisions that we set up to do that we thought the things would still all go to the full council and it's no what happened. So I'm asking Mr. Laurie how we could go look at that again. Is that something we could look at? Because I think it would involve involve the bit of the collaborative working of the council. Collaborative working certainly works in the the in other judicial systems, licensing, obviously the, the convener there does a great job and we all support him and we all work very collectively. Planning, as I say, is also um, work on a whole. Um, sometimes we hear different views, but it works on a very, very, um, very well. And when we talk about doors open, that was another point that was discussed as well. So apart from Mr. Laurie's answer, looking for um, certainly, Councillor Alexander's door was open, and uh, Councillor Michael John's door was always open to myself. And you know, I went in a lot of times, and it was very good when we used to have the council meetings and we were all at the buildings because I used to sit and we used to talk to other members. And uh, Malcolm Nicker was another one that was very welcoming. We sat and we had discussions, friendly discussions after meetings. And uh, it was a good way forward. And I learned a lot from Councillor Alexander for his experiences in the council and as I say, for his, his work with the community. So I benefited a lot from meeting, talking in quiet ways forward with, with the thing. So I, I think there there is a lot to add, but I don't think the system we've got working for home and uh, the executive system adds to what we what we look for. But I'll ask okay. Mr. Laurie to answer. Okay, you, you, there's a lot came out, eh, eh, Councillor McClucky there, um, and uh, I'm sure that you're uh, going to answer this question, Mr. Laurie. Um, yes, thank you, um, uh, Provost. I mean, I think the, the the basic answer is that it is for the council to determine its um, decision making um, structure, and in terms of how um, it might do that, I wonder if this is a good point, perhaps, to bring in. Uh, Mr. Moody, Provost. Okay, Mr. Moody, would you like to come in? Yes, thank you very much, Provost. And I think there have been some very helpful and interesting observations made about the the structure of our decision making. 
I suppose my response to some of that is that the structure is important and it's important that we try and keep it under review and have a system which facilitates uh, collaborative working, collaborative leadership if we can, but the system on itself cannot be the answer because it has to be coupled with culture of collaborative leadership if that's what the council wants to aim to. And I think there's a strong commitment among the senior officers to aim towards that culture of collaborative leadership and to work with the members of the council towards achieving that. Provost, I was struck by the comments from Councillor McClucky there, making the observations around the fact that members can work very well and collaboratively together in some of the, the fora and decision-making bodies of the council. Councillor McClucky was referring to the licensing board, and I recognise exactly what he is saying about that. So members can work well together. I'm not sure it is around the structure of the executive that is the barrier for that. We have to, I think, accept the the hard reality of the fact that we have a council which has three larger political groups within it, none of whom have a majority on the council. And my observation on that is it's not surprising then to find that there is an executive body which doesn't then have a majority for one particular administration. That I think is the reality of the situation. <clears throat> the issue is around developing the culture to allow the collaboration to take place within that body. And that's not to say that we have the present system stuck in stone. Uh, it's always open, as the Chief Executive was saying to the Council to decide on a new decision-making structure and to decide that this is a point to think about a new decision-making structure. As yet, I think there hasn't been, to my mind, a, a groundswell of opinion towards that end. But if that is something that the Council wants to do, then it's always open to the Council to initiate such a review. But what I would say around that is it needs to be something which we spend time on. And it needs to be something which involves members in that process. And that's reflective, I think, of the, the work that was done prior to the introduction of the executive system, where the previous system, which has been referred to by Councillor McCluckey, I think was looked at in some detail. And some of the flaws that existed within that, I think, were strongly in the minds of the members of the Council at the time when the current executive structure was introduced. So that's all I think I want to say in relation to that promise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Bowes. Thank you, Provost. It just took my fine, uh, second to find my unmute button there. Um, I agree with a lot of what John said, but I also understand what Mr Moody um, said as well. And and I think it is a lot about the you know the talk about changing minds and hearts on on collaboration. Now I, I've looked at the last five years and and I know that the the all member briefings and I've been at various meetings when cross party we've asked for all members briefings on things. And I understand this is relatively new. Has, has this been a and that the collaboration in doing that and and this isn't. The administration presenting these. This is this is officers, whether it be Kenneth or another senior officer. Um, it's actually presenting these to not not just the administration, not just as something that the administration is turning up on on the day of a meeting to present. It's something which they they have tried to get the information to all members of this council. I think Stephen had said earlier on, and touching on it, is that, that we we all have a collective leadership role. Um, unfortunately, that, that that sort of was misquoted earlier earlier on, and, and it, as thirty councillors, we all have it. Um, and I hope that a good number of you understand it. 
again, work is similar with John. I've got the appeals committee where we work exceptionally well uh, together. There is there has also been things outside council where I've worked with um, members of both the Labour and the Conservative Party, and and we have worked extremely well together. And uh, yourself, probably. Sorry, I forgot you you were involved um, in one of them as well. So we can do it. What what's stopping us from doing it? Is the communication we're putting out, the collaboration we have tried to put out there, has it just not been enough? And is there something that the officers could recommend that we could do more? But but my understanding is, and, and Kenneth, it might not be for you to answer, it may be another um, senior officer to answer, the difference between previous administrations uh, and, w and where we've been this time. Okay, thank you for the question. I don't know who's going to come in. I would say that having like uh, Councillor Spears, Councillor Alexander, Councillor Nimmo, Councillor Gold is no here, having over uh, 30 years experience everybody's had and, and over it, that there has been so many changes to the structures of the council. I remember one, I'll highlight this, which caused consternation amongst members when they brought forward the Policy and Resources Committee, which was really like an executive committee where it seemed to be, if you weren't on the Policy and Resources Committee, then you had really no say in what was going on in the Council. So over the years, there has been many changes, but it's good at this stage where people are beginning to maybe, say, take away the um, the, the, the banners of um, uh, politics and try and come together. It sounds wonderful, and it would be wonderful it would happen, but I'll bring somebody in. Would it be yourself, Mr. Moody, would like to come in on that? Question from a uh, um, councillor Bowes about what what really can can we do and to try and make make something a reality. I think Thank also the, the difference. Sorry, yeah. can, uh, Mr. Moody, for your answer, and also the difference in the stuff that we've introduced this time. Thank you, um, Provost. I think councillor Bowes's more pointed question was the issue of what's different for the yeah. present administration, and. I suppose one observation I would make about that is back to the point around the blunt reality of it being a minority administration is a difference from what was the position prior to the current council term, where previously there have been majority administrations within the council. That's a very different political landscape. I think the other difference that I would observe over the course of the current council term is the the blunt fact of, of the COVID pandemic and the fact that we've had to have our meetings remotely rather than physically. We've all largely worked uh, at home rather than within buildings. And I think to build on the point again that Councillor McClucky was making earlier on, I think it's easier to have conversation and collaboration when people were physically present. There was a chance for more informal contact between members and groups, between leaders, between leaders and the members of the groups. And I think to the extent that we lack collaboration and collaborative leadership, that has not helped. And there's been reference to to open doors. The open doors are, are often remote doors now, uh, and it's not quite so easy to have the kind of informal contact that members have referred to. So there is something around that as well, and the potential for the prospect of more collaborative contact between members as we emerge from the pandemic situation. I think, which may assist us in the future. Thank you, Provost. We'll go straight back now. Thank you. Straight back now to Councillor Michael John to wind up. Thank you. Thank you, um, Provost. And I'll, I'll try and keep my comments um, kind of brief. Um, I, I agree with um, a number of points that have been made. And um, you know, having listened to Councillor McClucky in particular, um, that there, he's, he's made some very good observations um, there, which um, I, I can resonate with. 
Um, but what um, we, we can't um, forget is, as a minority, um, the SNP took on the lead role. And uh, as a result, um, I don't believe the opposition parties have accepted that. They've never accepted that. And, and that's why we've ended up with the, the kind of hybrid decision making that we've had. But in doing that, um, they've chosen um, to, to want all the power without responsibility. Um, and, and have put that back onto the administration, um, knowing that, um, that that's, that's just not possible without that collaboration and, and, and consensual decision making. Saying that, I have to reflect that through the executive, there's not been overly many um, divisions. Um, and it's more tended to be within council, and that maybe reflects on the memberships. Um, but what still remains is leadership um, isn't just about the administration, and that's what the, the Best Value Report is quite clearly making, um, is leadership is about all the elected members. And um, that, that's, that's something that I think everybody has to, to take on board. And I would, I would suggest that the Labour group in particular maybe need to reflect on that and their role in where we are right now um, in particular. And just by way of examples, some of the criticisms that have come forward, um, you know, Alison spoke about the HQ project. Um, okay, the policy development um, as it is, is, is through Council of the Future, and um, we have that special board, and that's the, a safe space and an opportunity for people to bring forward um, suggestions, make comments, um, feed into the process. And perhaps it's just a case it's not the right people that have been involved in that. Um, because, to be honest, the opposition parties haven't really brought forward um, much by way of, of um, constructive um, dialogue in, in that. Uh, and therefore, we get to council, we get planned amendments that take us no fear um, over a period of time that doesn't allow that decision to happen. And um, I think that is one of the criticisms that's coming forward is we're not getting to a point of making that, those decisions. So it has to work both ways. Similarly, um, I, I'm, I'm really surprised that the other political groups haven't looked to try and make a minority administration work to their best effect um, and actually use that collaboration through the open door. Um, because while I've had numbers of conversations with individuals, um, no one has brought forward things um, that they could, we could actually, they wanted to see taken forward that we could work on um, and actually create compromise on. Um, so I think there has to be a reflection in the opposition's role um, within council as well, and, and, and look at that as we go forward. Because undoubtedly, the, the current um, structures aren't really working to the best effect to get the right decisions out of them. But that's part of the, the culture of the decision making and the polarised politics um, there that isn't necessarily doing um, the, the, be the best for the people that we're represented for. Um, but Falkirk has a huge oppor opportunities um, in front of it just now. Um, the, the whole council area and the, the progress that we have made, um, particularly around the funding that has come to us and the, the, the need for that investment to be taken forward in, in a constructive way and the good decisions that need to be taken by the council to enable us to address some of our priorities. Um, particularly around the financial challenges, but um, the, 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 for the future of the whole council area, we need to have those good decisions. Um, and it will take a change of mindset to do that, recognising um, where compromise is required, and that is done in a constructive way. Because it, one thing that's for sure is no matter how difficult the decisions are before us, we can take them in the best interests of those representing us. And by being open and transparent and honest, particularly with our communities, um, we will be able to deliver on that collaborative working. But it will take a change of mindset to be able to do that in, in, in going forward. Um, much of that will not happen until after the council elections. Um, we are so far down the line um, with only a few more meetings to go. But we do have the budget before us. And that is going to be critical to resetting for the new council coming in. Uh, I truly hope that there's the ability to have those constructive discussions before we get to budget day on the 2nd of March, 
that will demonstrate that we all do have the interests of all our citizens at, at heart within Falkirk, and we will do our best to deliver for them, um, no matter what. Thank you, Provost. Okay, thank you. Now, listen, I've got a sincere apology to Councillor Nimmo. I believe that he'd flagged up a 19-1. Um, and if you don't mind, I'll go back to him before we formally move the recommendation contained within the report. I've just been notified just now. Did you have a 19-1, Councillor Nimmo? Yep, thanks, Provost. I did put it in the chat uh, just right. after Councillor Hughes spoke at 12 o'clock, and I've just been waiting to get in since then. Right. Uh, Nineteen one relates to Councillor Hughes's initial contributions, and he posed a question regarding council leadership. Uh, it's just to point out yet again that the SNP, being the largest party in Falkirk Council, are the leaders of the council. Perhaps Gordon maybe forgot that point, but uh, politics will always be part of the decision-making process in all councils. There's no getting away for that. Uh, whether that's fortunate or unfortunate, but uh, we look forward okay. to the future. Thanks, Provost. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for giving us the opportunity. Now, going back to uh, winding up, have we agreed the recommendations contained within the report? Agreed. agreed. Everybody agreed. Thank you. Now, it's 25 to 1, so we've been here for um, over two and a half hours. This is could be quite a lengthy debate as well, so I'm, I'm going to I'm going to close the meeting at the moment uh, for lunch, and we'll see everybody back in one hour. Okay? Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Um, we're now going to item four on your agenda today. The Falkirk Plan 221 to 231. It's pages 14 to 84 on your agenda papers, and the report is by our Chief Executive. Thank you, Mr. Laurie. Thank you, Provost, and good afternoon. Um, this report presents members with the final Falkirk plan for 2021 to 31 and the delivery plan for 2021 to 24, um, and sets out how this will support the delivery of the recommendations uh, in the best value assurance report, which we um, we've just considered. So, the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015 places a legal duty on community planning partnerships to produce a 10-year local outcomes improvement plan. The Act also um, places a shared accountability on community planning partnership members to work together to deliver uh, the outcomes identified within it. And the partnership must report progress on its delivery um, to the public on an annual basis. The Falkirk Plan is the new local outcome and improvement plan for Falkirk's community planning partnership. It was developed through a rigorous uh, process of research, analysis, and engagement. It prioritizes addressing inequalities and developing the importance and value of people, pride of place, and community belonging. The focal plan focuses on six areas or themes for improvement over the next 10 years, uh, with a total of 23 outcomes sitting within them. The plan itself is at Appendix 1. And the themes are working in partnership with communities, poverty, mental health, substance use, gender-based violence, and economic recovery and employment. And the outcomes cover a range of issues of critical importance to the well-being of our communities. And there's a lot of detail um, and a lot of issues um, set out within the plan. Um, the delivery plan, which is um, appended uh, appendix two to the report is a, is a three year plan, which will help the council and its partners uh, meet the recommendations of the best value review report in relation to both performance management and embedding the new approach to community engagement and empowerment. And from a council perspective, that is aligned uh, with the work of the council of the future projects, community shaping focus future and closer to communities and community choices, both of which uh, had recent update reports to the Council's executive. The delivery structure, which is Appendix 3, focuses the partnership on working uh, to its outcomes and makes use of the expertise and collaborative networks that already exist, whilst identifying potential areas where new partnership groups may be required. 
In terms of um, locality planning, I just wanted to touch on this because it is specifically mentioned, of course, in the best value report. The delivery plan includes um, the delivery of three locality plans by the summer of this year, building on the work that had been done primarily um, or much of it in advance of the pandemic. And the details of that are set out at paragraph 7.2 of the covering report. So, um, in conclusion, uh, Province of Oka Plan provides a framework of the priorities of local residents, public sector, and third sector services across Falkirk, provides a shared commitment to work jointly uh, to deliver on these priorities. And the recommendations in front of the Council today are to approve the Falkirk Plan as a basis for future corporate planning and strategy work, to note the responsibility of Falkirk Council in delivering outcomes um, of the Falkirk Plan in partnership with other community planning partners, and to note that the actions set out in the report will support the Council and its partners in meeting the requirements of the recent best value uh, review. And perhaps, Provost, I could just conclude by thanking all of those who have contributed to this work um, across uh, the partnership, I think particularly Jen Kerr, our communities and Fair Falkirk uh, manager for her work in bringing all of this together. And myself and colleagues would be happy to take questions. Thank you, Provost. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Lord. I'll go straight to the leader of the council, Councillor Michael John. Thank you, Provost. Um, I would just like to concur with um, what the um, Chief Executive said that there's been a huge amount of work going into pulling this particular um, plan together. Um, and um, it's been done in a very professional way. And um, there's a lot of credit to the team um, who have very recently, um, in, in uh, relative terms, come together um, and, and, and doing this piece of work. And it's a hugely positive piece of work uh, for us. Uh, the Falkirk Plan um, replaces what, what is statutorily called the Local Outcomes and Delivery Plan, and there's an obligation of um, community planning partners um, to produce this. Not an easy name uh, to identify with, um, for, particularly for our communities, and the Falkirk Plan means so much more um, to people. And I just think the whole um, way of working with this um, particular plan um, has, has been very beneficial um, in helping to develop the, the different ways of engaging with our communities and going forward. Um, I know that the staff are very proud um, of the plan, and, and I am as well, um, particularly because of the high level of collaboration across all partners and our communities that went into developing it. Um, the process was very inclusive and very deliberative um, of that. Uh, the joint strategic needs assessment that was the beginning of the process very much reflects the views and the input of all the public partners. Uh, the discussions among partners with their communities has helped us all understand the experiences of local people and communities, with much more lived experience being used to determine um, the themes and the priorities, um, and, and therefore the difficulties that they're facing. As a result, um, we're, we're improving how we work together and communicating more across the partnership, and that has been a hugely um, positive experience for, for everyone. And as a result, we should see much better collaboration and the focus on the on the plan going forward. Uh, it sets out the priorities and actions for a 10-year span, with a delivery and monitoring plan to support that, covering the first three years allowing for a review and the development of an updated de de delivery plan going forward. The themes and outcomes are based on what has been identified as key priorities, recognising that there are clearly interdependencies within them and they're all of equal status. Just for example, um, reducing child poverty by supporting families to become more economically active, by removing the barriers to sustainable employment, having fair work employers, reducing reliance and benefits, will not just help children out of poverty, but families, and that will then have an impact on health and well-being. And you can see how all the interdependencies start to come together. Similarly, there's a huge amount of work that is needed in addressing the high number of drug-related deaths within the area, um, access to safe and secure housing, access to mental health services, financial security, access to employment and rehab. And, and those are just some touches of, of the areas that we want to focus on 
um, going forward. The collaborative impact of all the partners working together will have a greater effect in getting a positive and sustainable outcome than any one organisation alone. Therefore, it's important that all partners are able to align resources in order to support the delivery plan. As the Chief Executive has said, that the locality, um, plan, locality plans and the local action plans will dovetail so that it will be able to be seen at a very local level, recognising the challenges before us. The recovery from the impacts of the pandemic are the focus for the first phase. We have a, a plan that is outcome focused and we have commitments from partners and a robust monitoring plan that will enable the public to scrutinise and see progress. We need to how and how we need to get to that impending plan jointly delivered on. The new delivery plan is focused on monitoring and evaluation as a priority, and we will it will be co-designed um, and logical modelling and collaborative evaluation reports that will be able to be scrutinised by the community planning partners and the individual partners and the public. And that is something that will be seen on the new website that hopefully will be developed through the community planning partners. This will deepen the partnership shared understanding of the needs of Falkirk. And I think that is something that has got to be commended. <clears throat> I would thank everyone who's been involved in the development and collating the plan. It's been a huge task, a good team that's working on it, and a real support and commitment from our partners who all want to make a difference. Um, so I would commend the plan to you and um, ask that we um, endorse uh, the plan and note the um, action plan, or the delivery plan, sorry, uh, get my, my, my reports mixed up, um, the delivery plan going forward. And this is a hugely positive step for our communities and one that we can all take some credit within and working with our communities to deliver on. Thank you, Provost. Thank you. Have you got a second there? Councillor Colley. Hey, thank you. Um, I'm just going to in second in the recommendations. I'm not going to say too much um, as a member of the Community Planning Board. Uh, we've had the opportunity to see this, so I'm sure. Um, members will have lots of questions. I don't want to take up too much time. I think we'll all probably agree on the six areas for improvement and the key outcomes. And I think you'll all recognise the alignment with other plans, including within the Council, NHS and the Health and Social Care Partnership. This approach of us all working together towards creating improvements with each body bringing its own strength and, strength and experience. Um, the plan focusing on involving our communities tackling poverty and exclusion, helping to support and prevent mental ill health, reducing the impact of substance misuse, particularly in reducing drug related deaths, supporting people experiencing gender based violence, violence and building more wealth in our communities that stays in our, more wealth in our communities that stays in our communities, including expanding access to training and employment. You'll see. The next iterations of the locality planning, working directly with our communities, with actions and the development informed by them. Um, I know that my ward, like all the communities across the district, has some amazing people and groups that are making an appreciable difference to our communities and to communities of interest like disabled people. And building on this work with partners and wider community experience and concerns can help develop tailored actions for our areas. Finally, as, as Councillor Michael John mentioned, the delivery and monitoring plan is critical. Uh, not only do we want to make a difference, but we need to see how and when that will be achieved and the steps along the way, being responsive to change and listening to lived experience. And of course, that we're actually making the difference that we want to. So finally, I just want to reiterate a thank you to everybody involved. And I know it's been an enormous piece of work um, and, and, and I know there's even more work going forward. So uh, thank you very much for everyone involved. OK, thank you, Councillor. Go straight, straight to Councillor Nimmo. Uh, has your group got an amendment to to the recommendation? Thanks, Provost. No, we don't have a, an amendment, but I do have a few comments again to make in relation to this. Yep. Obviously, this report is linked to the, the previous one, one, and there's been mention of the, the community planning partnership on a number of occasions. Now, I've heard from some people that the, the community planning partnership is basically just regarded as a talking shop uh, and serves very little purpose. Now, I would suggest that we really need to get rid of this stigma 
uh, and concentrate on the important work that the, the partnership does. It's also important that we get regular feedback regarding what they're actually achieving. Uh, and I note from the, the report as well, there's there's no costings involved here. How much is it going to cost to take this plan forward? Because uh, that could have a, a major impact on anything that's stemming from the, the report. Thanks, Provost. Okay, thank you. We'll go thank you, Mr. Laurie. Mr. Laurie, question brought up there. The important one is in relation to the costings. Um, yes, thank you. I'll um, deal with the, the first um, point first, really, about the, um, the Community Planning Partnership as, as, as a talking shop. And I think that Community Planning Partnerships, there is a risk of that. Um, but I think that the work that's been done in the most recent period has moved, moved us decisively on um, from that um, position. You know, community planning partnerships exist in order to um, improve outcomes in communities. They need to be action focused. They need to be ensure that the the work set out in the community plan and other documents is being um, delivered. And certainly recently, if I think about you know sessions at the community planning partnership in relation. For example, to the work work being done in relation to poverty, or the long running and very impressive, very challenging work in relation to tackling drug related uh, deaths, which I think has engaged a lot um, of in people. People, these important issues are ones where we're seeing action, and what this plan is about is bringing together the existing plans of the various organisations, ensuring that they're well linked up, taking on board um, community views through consultation, and, and also um, making maximum use of all the data that is available through the, um, the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment, which the, um, the leader mentioned, bringing something together really comprehensive that provides us with a strong basis for action. So I think the way that the Community plan Planning Partnership um, overcomes the views of any um, doubters there might be is by continuing this very positive work, which has been um, in play uh, for the last couple of years um, or, or, or so in terms of you know that dynamic and energetic and progressive approach. In terms of the financial um, aspects as set out in the um, report at 9.2, there are no specific additional financial implications at this stage. And I guess that flows from the fact that this is a coming together of already existing um, plans which are costed and resourced by the different um, organisations involved. Um, and there is an expectation um, on the community planning partners that they will direct their resources as set out in the plan. And as I say, that is as um, they have already committed uh, to do through their own um, corporate planning or other plans. So there's no specific additional financial implication at this stage, but clearly the resource involved in bringing this all together and delivering for our communities is very significant. Okay, thank you for that, Ms. Laurie. Um, I don't know whether problems. Councillor Kerr has left the, um, the meeting, so I'm going to the Conservative group to see if any of their members are coming forward with an amendment. Councillor Harris. Thomas, thank you. Yes, apologies from uh, Councillor Kerr to, uh, to uh, leave the meeting at lunchtime. Uh, we have no amendment to make, but uh, I have uh, one or two comments to make. It's certainly a very full report with some great aspirations. And whilst I, I recognise that it is a 10 year plan and in terms of delivery, we're talking about the next four, four years. So, um, you know, we we look forward to hearing more about how we are going to implement the changes, which will bring about the aspirations, uh, the six aspirations there that, uh, that are in the plan. Um, as was said under the previous item, um, it's unfortunate that we as a group have not been part of the, the planning partnership. And I would hope that um, going forwards, that uh, certainly into the next council, council we can we can rectify that. But certainly it's a very full report 
Uh, I, I had just had one question around the locality planning. I recognise that the process for this started back in 2020, and we had three uh, areas where, where, uh, who took up the, the reins um, to set about doing this. Um, obviously, things have been stalled, although I, it's good to note that uh, all three projects have now been res resurrected. Given the, the diversity of our communities and the fact that many of the localities have different problems uh, in relation to that, can, can you give me a, a timeline as to whether these locality, the, the number and uh, location of the locality plannings is going to be increased and over what sort of time period? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Laurie. <clears throat> yes, thank you, um, Provost. Um, I mean, the obligation on the community planning um, partnership is over time to develop um, lo locality plans for each um, uh, locality. And we're, we're, we're going to need, I think, to make some changes in our, our approach to get that coverage and to get that coverage at the appropriate scale, which is meaningful um, for communities. But in terms of, and, and that is a significant um, an ongoing piece of work. In terms of, um, I've used the likely time scale for that with your agreement, Provost. I'm going to ask uh, my colleague Jen Kerr to come in just to give an update on that. That'd be fine. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we're just currently looking at the range of um, plans that, and areas that we'd like or noted an interest of doing their own planning area. Um, each exercise is, is a mini exercise in local data and local information, local community priority, local community deliberation and engagement. So it's not um, something we take lightly or do quickly. And we'd like to pay equal value and importance and time for each exercise and support communities to do um, their own inquiries and their own engagement work. So we are making plans for that and looking at the resource implications and trying to come up with a ruling plan so that we can continually be working on completing one plan and starting a new one where there's an interest. Okay, thank you for that. Um, is that you, Councillor Harris? No more questions? No, that's fine. Thank you, Provost. Okay, as, as just to clarify where we are, we have our motion moved and seconded. There are no amendments, so it's really questions only at this time. We've got a number of people that want to come in. We've got Councillor Black next, Councillor Grant, Councillor Spears and Councillor Monroe. So we'll start off with Councillor Black, thank you. I, I, I don't know if really maybe if, if there are questions or not. I'll probably maybe we can turn them into questions, but I've got a few concerns. Uh, and in 2017, I, I, I went I went to Carnville House or Carnville House, to, uh, and we, we discussed substance issues as as one of the one of the, the the big issues for the partnership, and with lots of plans and aspirations with that and. That the, the Scottish Government has brought forward House and First, which is a great, great idea, and I think it, it will work through time. But it hasn't it, nothing so far has reduced the amount, number of drug deaths. And since 2012, I've lobbied for a rehab place in this area because we've got so many people living in Grangewood and Camlin and other places that have got addiction issues. And in 2017, Councillor Bissett joined me with that lobbying campaign. And over the years, we managed to get a, 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 a reassurance for officers that they would, they would look at setting up a pilot. And that pilot was set up with a local housing association. And it, it was very early days. It was only maybe a, a couple of people were ever in it. But the, the housing association was very positive about how it transformed the people's lives and set them off in a good direction. But it, this was stopped and it was just absorbed in the house and first and decided that we didn't need anything like that. And the only way I found out, which I thought was really disappointing, was through asking the question, how's the rehab, how's the rehab going? And I was told, well, we stopped it because it's been absorbed in the house and first. And I still think that we need some type of resource in this area. Uh, because of the, I know we have a slightly lower number of drug deaths than the national average, but we have got a big problem. <laughs> so other other questions I wanted to ask was <clears throat> public transport, and we're saying that obviously we need good transport to, to to help people get out of poverty, to help people get jobs, etc. But our transport system in this area is absolutely awful, 
it, obviously it's worse through COVID because of the, 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 the limitations that the service has just now due to shortages of staff, etc. <clears throat> but we, we don't have a lot of influence, we don't have any influence with the bus companies and we don't, and we, we don't, we, we, we just we need to have more influence here because we, we can't get from Granger to Coleman, for example, you have to get two buses, which is ridiculous. Economic recovery, uh, our ETU, as far as I'm aware, uh, outsources its apprenticeship training to, business, local, to local businesses and other stakeholders. And we could be, if, if that is the case, and hopefully I'll be corrected, but if that's the case that we aren't training our own apprentices, then we really should be because we've, we've got a real shortage of skilled workmen in, in uh, our own in housing and, and you know, department. We need we need more skilled works people and we need to train them. We should be training them ourselves. And young people's mental health, it's a great aspiration to, 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 to say that we want young people's mental health to be to, to be improved and we want you know, them to have good mental health and so they should have. But there's a that's a limitation that we that's something that we can't provide. It's a, it's a national objective. We've got a huge shortage of clinicians of all different brands and varieties, and you can't deliver good mental health services unless you have clinicians. And the CAMS services throughout Scotland and, 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 and especially locally are struggling so hard to get clinicians because we don't train enough. So we really need to look nationally at how we train people because we, we have got no influence on that locally, and that is one of the biggest issues. So I would quite like to hear if we, if we do train our own apprentices, I'd like to find out that. And if there's anything more that we can do to influence the, 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 the public transport at a local level, because we're not doing a very good job just now. Thank you, Provost. No, thank you. There's a lot of good substance in there and a lot of areas that we're all concerned about. And there's that's been sort of down to some questions that was included there. So. Mr. Law, are you going to come in, or are you going to bring some of your colleagues in in relation to the the three major points here at the end, the Councillor Black? I'm I'm going to bring um, colleagues in with your agreement. Um, yeah. so obviously, I think in terms of the um, the local housing association pilot and where we are with that, that would be uh, Kenny Gillespie. I think on both public transport and the ETU, um, Douglas Duff, and perhaps on children's mental health, I'd ask. Robert Naylor to uh, come in, Provost. That's perfect. So, but Mr. Gillespie first, then. Well, thanks very much. And uh, as Councillor Black is, is is well aware, she's she's worked very closely with our service in regards to housing and, and spoke with our senior officers. Councillor Black is also very right in regards to housing. First, uh, superseded the, the potential need of additional rehab centres. What we have said, and we have said before, as uh, Councillor Black says, is the numbers may have not reduced within Falkirk, but at the same time, it's how much we have prevented because there is a rise in drug use. So we feel that we've got a positive outcome. Housing first is very much about relating to a centre person's approach within their home, making sure that that's a stable foundation. We see this as very positive at the present time, and uh, only this week of a further meeting with our team with additional funding to support, uh, again, the direction that we're going with Housing First with potentially more officers to deal with these issues. It's certainly something that all other local authorities are looking at and see that as the positive and the right way forward. We'll always review that and we'll always look at other uh, preventative measures, but at the present time, that's certainly the direction that we're looking at to go forward, and we'll continue to do that. But also, as Councillor Black says, we will review that to see if there is ever a need to look at a different option than that, Provost. Okay, thank you, Douglas. Um, the questions in relation to the issues with transport. Yeah, happy to respond on that, Provost. That um, we, in relation to transport, we are working productively with bus operators and other partners on developing a, a local transport strategy. That work is underway just now, and we expect that, that work will take some time to get together because of a range of issues that we need to uh, address there. Um, so it's probably going to be the end of the year before that, that strategy comes together. Um, but it will look to, to address the kinds of concerns about people getting access to work, et cetera. And we'll look to take advantage of schemes like the bus partnership Fund where we've been successful with getting some proposals through the first round 
of that process and it has the potential to access some significant capital funds for improvement of the public transport network. Um, so, yes, it is very much something that we will be giving attention to. We will be working with those partners to help to um, improve that, that, that process. We've also had some funds uh, made available through the recent growth deal announcement to create a public transport hub around Falkirk Grahamston to create a, a Falkirk Central facility that will be a multimodal hub uh, serving the area. So that again will, will add to the complement of uh, assets that will support transport, um, but very much a, a, an area that will evolve over the course of this year. In relation to the work of the employment and training unit and the capacity for modern apprenticeships, it is an issue that the, the number of apprenticeship places has been reducing. That partly has been down to the lack of uh, resources, lack of funds that uh, various employers have, but also the consequence of COVID and the fragmented uh, capacity that they have to offer continuity of apprenticeship places. We did give uh, an update to the scrutiny committee back in November. Uh, Sarah McCulley gave a presentation on the work uh, that ETU have underway um, on employability and a range of measures, not solely modern apprenticeships, but uh, schemes like the Kickstart programme, the Young Persons Guarantee, No One's Left Behind, work that we uh, undertake to help um, people where they may not necessarily access a full apprenticeship program, but are getting modules of skills that will improve their capacity. ETU are very much the facilitator of these these programs. It's limited the actual uh, content of these schemes that they deliver themselves, um, and and so uh, Councillor Black's right that we involve uh, third sector organisations and and others to deliver the training and we find that that's the most effective means for it to be delivered that takes advantage of the full range of facilities the third sector has to offer across the area. It's very much connected into the most deprived communities or disadvantaged groups like uh, people with disabilities, young unemployed people, etc. ETU are very uh, able and, and skilled in understanding their needs and targeting programmes towards them. And that will be a fundamental component of the work that we're going to be taking forward through this plan. Okay, thank you, Mr. Duff. And ask Mr. Duff another question. Uh, right, quickly, yes, fine, thank you. It was just to ask Mr. Duff if there isn't a possibility of the, the ETU employing more trainers rather than concentrating on facilitating, because we, we do have a shortage of trained, uh, trained workmen in our workforce. We need, we need, we need to grow our own. And we've I always thought we did grow our own, and, and, and it was a shock to me when I found out recently that we didn't. So I, I just think there's more work to be done there, and that we could we could uh, we've got the potential for something good there if we do actually start uh, recruiting trainers rather than more facilitators and actually train our own. We do we do employ some of our own, so we employ some people with specialist uh, skills to support people with particular disadvantages that they have. So. To be able to target some of the uh, particular groups who need support, um, but the ETU's work is done through um, coordinators. Co they manage normally a caseload of thirty to forty um, trainees, and they commission the support for them from a range of providers. So, as an example, Serenians are a good example of a, a local third sector organisation. They've got the facility over at Arnotdale, and and they've got a range of environmental and IT and other programmes that um, they can deliver. And we find that that's the most cost effective uh, means of delivering these programmes. It helps us to attract in the external funding that allows these programmes to be run. And as I say, Sarah's always happy to demonstrate the kind of work that they've been doing and their capacity uh, that they have to offer. Okay, thank you. The next, next point is, um, which is on everybody's conversation, is the mental health issues, and uh, we'll go to Mr. Naylor. Mr. Naylor. Thanks, Provost. <clears throat> um, member, members will be aware that the Scottish Government have provided funding uh, in two tranches, one for uh, school-based counselling services um, and another grant for the development of 
community based mental health services for uh, children and young people up to the age of 24. Work has continued through the course of the year in terms of mapping out all of the, the various provisions that are available to bridge the, the gap that there exists between, if you like, standard pastoral care in schools, all the way up through various differentiated approaches, all the way up to the CAM service that Councillor Black uh, mentioned. There's a report in preparation that will come to the March meeting of the Education Children and Young People Executive, and that will set out various components of what this funding will be used for, which will be a combination of training for the workforce in terms of, for example, um, mental health first aid awareness for, for the workforce, but also the various different third sector organisations um, and external counselling resources that can be accessed so that we can signpost uh, schools to direct uh, children and young people to for a variety of different uh, mental health issues. I think Councillor Black is correct in saying that the, the CAM service, not just in Forth Valley, but nationally, has uh, been under incredible pressure over many years, not just during the COVID period, but I understand that NHS have been given additional funding to recruit and train further uh, mental health officers within the CAM service. But the, the task before us within the Council is, is to map that bridge between, if you like, the lowest level mental health difficulties when they first arrive um, with graded interventions all the way up to meeting the threshold for CAMs which is a very high threshold as it currently sits. As I say, there'll be a report detailing all of that work uh, in early March to the Education, Children and Young People Executive. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for the questions, eh, Councillor Black. They were pertinent to everybody. Councillor Grant. Um, thank you, Provis. Um, it's about CAMS. Um, Councillor Black um, touched on it, and that was my question anyway. Um, on as Mr Naylor says, this is pre-pandemic. When I first got involved with CAMS, it was a 26-week waiting list, and ever since it keeps going up. If you could look at, if Mr Naylor could look at page 40 for his provost, and the, the waiting list for July and September 20 were 35 weeks for Fourth Valley, then 43 weeks for October, December, then January, March 21, it was 56 weeks. But then it says April, June, it was nine weeks. Do we have an explanation how we managed to get the figures down to nine weeks? And what is the current figures if we managed to do that, Provost? That good, good question. Who's going to answer that one? Sorry, Provost, not, not able to provide that detail, but obviously can ask the question. Yes. Okay, then you've heard that, Councillor Grant, is the, the information in relation to your question, isn't it available from officers just now? And I'm quite sure that they'll get it as soon as possible. And I think it should come to every member because I think that's a very important issue that you brought up. Um, okay. Thank you, Provost. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Councillors, it's Councillor Spears now, followed by Councillor Munro and Councillor McClucky. Councillor Spears. Okay, thank you. The Falkirk plan focuses on tackling poverty and inequality in all its forms. Surely that is great news and that is why we're here. And it's very interesting to see the service users' feedback who have, and I quote, have loved the passion from community members who contribute well in their communities. This is, answers all the last agenda items questions. And it's great to see that communities are doing it for themselves. I've been closely involved at the coalface with a local food bank who have just had um, recognition in both local and national press uh, and uh, praised in the Scottish Parliament for the, the, the work they're going to do with, with drug users. Because one problem leads to another problem. Poverty leads to alcoholism, drug abuse and, and lack of food. So you, you you can't escape the problem unless you address the whole basis of where it comes. 
And that brings us back to the reason for the plan is to focus on tackling poverty. And that's what our agenda should be. And I'm glad there's no amendments to this because it is the way forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your contribution, sir. Councillor Munro. Thank you, Provost. Um, I took the trouble to read the last um, Orca planning partnership meeting in, which was December 2020, and was really shocked to read that in Falkirk we had over 3,000 people um, who who, who uh, were had issues with with drugs and and how little support there was for them. And I agree with what. Alison says in terms of um, we 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 need we need to have a, a pathway to to help these people that that really positively works. Um, she also pointed out that much of this report seems to focus on elements which, whilst they're important and and touch on things council does, we can't influence and and. I feel it would be better uh, and a tighter report were we to focus on those things where we as a council could specifically do do the most to help because we, we can't help in in every situation and some of these elements are clearly more focused um, at, at, at um, um, the medical services that are being provided. Um, and if we look at page 52, it, it points out some of the key things, but it's almost like there's two reports here because at the beginning, you, you're talking, we're talking about locality planning and what communities want. And later on, there's very little that builds into community planning. What is it that communities want? And I'm not sure these really important issues around poverty uh, and, and substance use and things are, are the key drivers for ordinary people in the community. So is this one report or is it two reports? Because th th there doesn't seem to be a, a, a proper synergy. So that, that would be my first question. Okay, first question, Mr. Rory, you've heard that. Yeah, I think perhaps Provost, there's a couple of questions um, there, um, for, or, or a couple of points have been raised. I think I want to address. Um, firstly, the the point about um, as a council, that our role is not, you know, doesn't isn't, doesn't equally relate to all of the outcomes. Well, that's that's absolutely the case. I mean, this is a a community planning document. So there's the five statutory partners, of course, health. Um, are one of them, so a lot of responsibility sits with health for taking forward these um, issues. There's other elements where the role of the council is 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 very much a lead for some of the outcomes. Um, so no, the, 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 our involvement varies across the different elements, but in a sense, that just relates to the nature and the purpose um, of the document. It's a coming together of all the local partners, um, and, and in terms of their their strategies, their plans. Um, and their actions um, influenced by the data and to, and to go on to another point influenced by um, the communities. So in terms of what the communities want, this is the, the community plan is a product of that consultation, the discussions with um, communities as well as the work on research um, and data. So it's very much a single um, uh, report. It is the community plan that brings all of these things um, together and then the delivery and monitoring um, plan for the three year period, uh, which we'll review uh, on an ongoing basis. So I hope that helps, uh, Provost, with that question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. It's now an opportunity for Councillor McClucky, followed by Councillor Coombs. Question, sir. Thank you. I think, I think, well, I think you answer, ask questions. Uh, this item, uh, the last item, so we're looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. Aye, obviously the first one's transport and transport came up earlier on. I raised the question at the last council meeting as well, okay, Provost, and I got half an answer. Um, we are subsidised, we have legal contracts for buses 
um, that should run right into the evening. But as I say, the last boss is Slaman and receiving a cloak for a year, White Cross six a cloak. This plan talks about it shouldn't stop people um, from getting employment um, in this report here. So I'm asking, what are we doing to address it when the legal document saying that first bus should be running these services in the evenings and this council has allowed them to break the contract and no run the buses for a year? And people are already losing the jobs that we say in this plan that we're not going to allow to harm. So that's my first question. OK, then we'll take them one at a time. Uh, Douglas, Douglas, would you want to come back on this one? I'm, I'm not aware of the specific service that's affected their councillor, um, sorry, through you, Provost, um, but uh, ha happy to look at that. But uh, obviously, our public transport services have been severely affected by the pandemic and the reduction in the services that the, the <coughs> operators have been able to, to provide. Um, so it's possible that the loss of the service in the evenings has been down to that reduction that operators have been able to manage. Um, but in, in, so in terms of the approach that we've adopted, clearly we do subsidise a number of services at the present time, and that is for the purpose of reaching uh, rural areas or providing services at hours that allow people to access employment, all of that um, kind of requirement. And um, so it does tend to make, make sure that with what resources we do have, that we're able to enhance the service operator that um, the, the bus companies uh, can provide through their own means. And um, I've spoken to the bus operators, to a few of them, and I, I know how difficult it is for them during the pandemic and even prior to the pandemic uh, to keep bus services um, commercially uh, managed and able to, to be sustained and um, it's very difficult and therefore it's important that we uh, develop the, the new strategy for public transport that will hopefully give a more sustainable and longer term approach that meets the needs of communities. Well, okay, next question, John. I'm just to follow up on that one, eh, Provost, as a fact, as I'd asked us previously, and as I say, Chris Cox, he's been wearing seven months of communications of this, and I asked the last director, the new director, at the last meeting. So I'm asking for all the services that have eh, services reduced, and not just White Cross and Slaman, and have been for the last year, why they're allowed to break that service. Um, all the commercial services are running through the day, the ones that make money, and first bus choose to break a legal contract with the with the with the um with us. So as I say, if you can follow back up on that. My next question is um is obviously the poverty issue, which is also one of the other priorities, and that's been spoken to by members as well. And um, we just didn't hear food poverty now, we've got fuel poverty, and that's going to get worse. Now, the 10 year plan says, oh, we've always had this um, this issue, and it's great to hear Councillor Spears, I know who's, who's tried hard and worked with, with the food banks in his own area, right? Um, but we seem to be accepting that that's going to be that for the future. But these people who are in employee, even in employment, who are struggling to make ends meet. And what I didn't see is how we're going to go and halt it and stop the need for food banks and addressing or the fuel issues and deal with the issues. This plan just tells you, it doesn't tell you nothing. So I would like to hear from the officers what we're doing to enable us and Fokker to be able to say that we don't need the food banks because we've, re we've solved the problem because we just seem to accept that it's here now. Didn't it used to be here? Okay. That's my next question. You want to come back in, uh, Mr. Wally, on that one? Yes, thank you, Provost. I'll um, come in um, initially. Um, we, we had a, an update on the work relating to poverty at the most um, recent meeting of the Community Planning Partnership, which um, just, just last week, um, in fact. And I think if, um, you know, I suppose what, what really struck me was the, you know, the energy and the passion and the commitment of those engaged in this work um, to try and support families 
who are experiencing all the aspects of um, uh, poverty and the understanding that um, these interventions need to um, continue, they need to be broad ranging, they need to focus on um, the specific needs of um, individuals. Um, and there's a, lots of excellent work going on in that space, but the idea that this is something that we can resolve in um, the short term, I think, is, or even in the medium or longer term, is not um, realistic. And Councilman Clucky quite rightly, you know, points to, you know, the crippling increase in fuel costs, um, which an awful lot of families are going to be um, experiencing. And all we can do, I think, is use our resources and our energy and our commitment and working with partners and particularly in the voluntary sector to do all the things that we are currently doing and take that forward, we will alleviate it to the greatest possible extent. But I suppose there will be fundamental questions for the council moving forward as a new council sets its corporate priorities as it identifies what's most important to it. If actually that issue around about poverty, which is hugely increased over the period of the pandemic, is something which as a council, you feel needs to be a greater area of focus um, for us. I think as, you know, as officers, we absolutely understand and appreciate um, that focus that will require um, greater resources in the future. And it, that of course, then takes us right back to our financial challenges and our need to uh, deal with our immediate financial challenges so that we can put resources where you as members want to uh, put them in the future. <clears throat> okay, right. any more questions, John? Yes, yes, Provost. Next one is and obviously the mental health issue for, for children. And we, had, we heard Mr. Naylor there saying about the, obviously we've got these councillors into schools now with money coming for the government. And I believe that some of the, these councillors got a, a, a year's training or something before they started the roles. But I'm inundated with complaints about how it's working. More and more people self-harming, more and more people fit, no leave the house and, and, and causing mental health problems and, and that. And these the councillors don't receive, they're no linking with GPs, because obviously that link and the GP kind of get information because you've got to get permission of the child. So these issues come up. Um, so what support? We know that they kind of get to CAMS because it's up. It's, you know, you kind of get an appointment there, so the people kind of go to there if they feel that the child needs further support. So I'm getting all these concerns. So what are we going to do to address that for the young people? Firstly, the young people. Hey, right? Mr. Naylor, you want to come in on that one? Thanks, Provost. I mean, I, I think what Councillor McClucky highlights is is that there are some issues uh, around permissions given either by the young person or the young person's parents about the sharing of, of information. It's not a necessarily uh, direct link between uh, a general practitioner. Um, general practitioners uh, would tend to be uh, among those who might make a referral uh, to CAM services. Um, but in terms of, of the, the various supports that we're signposting young people to either through school-based counselling or counselling that takes place out to, outside the school, um, you're right that there are or, and can be some challenges in terms of uh, where, where those interventions are not seen to be effective, um, what uh, is the next step in terms of, of GPs. But what we're seeking to put in place is, is if you like, feedback and, emo and evaluation mechanisms that can mean that, that children can move from one service to another if that's deemed appropriate. I, I think the the issue in the country is that mental health has been given such a, a an awareness raising that the demand for these kind of services is probably the greatest it's it's ever been. Um, but it's just just maybe to reassure you that this is something that we are working collectively with community planning partners and with NHS colleagues to try and design something that gives us a pathway from, if you like, the lowest level uh, case of perhaps a short-lived anxiety around preparing for exams, all the way up to uh, one of the, the, the 
I think you, you yourself mentioned, Councillor, about children that are at the stage of self-harming. So it, it's very much a work in progress, uh, but the demand is, as you note, extraordinarily high. Um, but the good news is we, we now have funding to be putting something uh, in that will directly support and coordinate this uh, th through both schools and uh, community uh, opportunities. One other couple okay, of questions, convener, if I, if I may. The first one is on the climate change. We've obviously had all our training. We're all aware of the significance of this of this issue, and in fact, we need to address it. And I see it's in our, um, this document. However, the fact is, seven years ago, we were going to do our SP, um, SP, SPR to try to re look at the number of buildings and and age of these buildings. Um, buildings that are certainly, you know, gaining out a lot of admissions. Um, we haven't any funding in the budgets to go and address the budgets because after seven years we still haven't dealt with the with the SPR. Um, we have a lot. We we'll look at the budgets anew, and we haven't got the money for electric vehicles or other things in the forthcoming um, capital budgets. So. How are we going to address these targets? We're still waiting on the big money coming from the Scottish Government. Councillor Garders has been coming in, it's been coming there for well, I think you know, if they arrived. But um I'm, we're still waiting on that happening. So I wonder if you could tell us how we're going to achieve these targets when we don't have the the capital and means to alter our buildings and we're going to bring up back in these new schools, which are the worst carbon emitters, so they'll need to be substantial work then, but they're nothing in the capital program to to, to deal with. So okay. okay, you've got the question. I'll come back to you, Mr. Lorry, to see if you want to take it on first. Um, yes, thank you, Provost. A couple of comments from me, and then I'll ask um uh, Douglas uh, to come in. Um I mean it's 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 true to say that the um the targets which we have for climate change are going to be, well, I mean, they are exceptionally challenging in any case, um, but without resources to take forward the, um, the issues which are in the climate change action plan, then uh, we will struggle. Uh, we will be unable to achieve these um, targets. And I suppose what that does, and I, I mentioned it in the context of the previous report, it takes us right back to that issue of um, um, resolving is the matter around about financial sustainability. Because unless and in, or until we can invest monies in our capital program, however we choose um, to do that, then the issues around about SPR and climate change uh, remain out of reach. And it's so important that we move forward on that. But I'll, um, with your agreement, Provost, I'll uh, I suggest that Douglas comes in on this point. Douglas, happy to do that, Provost. And building on what the chief executive has said. Um, we have got a very active programme taking place across the council on climate change and quite considerable work taking place with our partners. And clearly the community plan relates more to that activity with our partners. And so you'll see outcome 22 of the plan notes the intention to help uh, reach the climate emergency targets that we've set and that we would work with partners to help to achieve that. And there are programmes of activity, particularly relating to uh, the work taking place down at Grangemouth and the announcement uh, just prior to Christmas of the growth deal funds has got a number of investments planned that will help to reduce our carbon emissions. So that, that's a very fundamental plank of the plan and how it will move forward. It will help to stimulate the economic recovery, which is the main theme that is, is highlighted in, in the plan. And um, so that work is uh, certainly planned to take place and we hope that as the resources come forward, that will help with that. Um, but I think an important point about climate change is to embed it in mainstream practice. And that's also part of the intentions of this plan. It becomes embedded in our work with our communities or work with partners and in the way that we deliver our own services and invest for the future. So there are some funds earmarked already in the capital program for measures that will enhance energy efficiency and, and in our purchasing 
of vehicles we're already committed to increasing the amount of for instance electric vehicles that we have in place and we hope to do more of that work and um, but the important thing is that as we invest as we deliver our, our services we are embedding that practice because the real success in achieving climate targets is going to be with changing the approach that all of us undertake and so across the capital program any project when it comes to for instance to be assessed uh, by our planners or by our building standards officers then the amounts of carbon emissions will be being assessed and um, to determine through that the contribution it will make to achieving the targets so just to conclude on this we are working on it and perhaps an important step with that will be the report that's coming to the executive next week which has the action plan on climate change as the product of the cross-party group that's been looking at this it involves work with our partners and sets out a whole range of actions that will embed practice across the, the council so we're hoping and see that plan approved at executive and that will allow all of these measures to move forward. Okay, thank you, Douglas. My uh, last question, Provost, one, one more question. question. Thank you. Aye, is on the addiction. Obviously that was brought up as well and obviously addiction is a major issue. Um, like you say, it's about the high drug deaths, um, alcoholism in the area and as I say, I've brought up the thing we didn't look at and I don't understand why all the other nations and 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 councils do, but the the issue with, with gambling. So three forms of addiction, um, all with the same um, sorry of problems. And as as Alison brought up earlier, we don't hear rehab places like Ireland, like all the other places in in, in uh, that was in the European Union. We didn't seem to have them. We had one one bed, I think. And the reality is we need people who make a decision to improve their lives to to get off, as I say, these drugs and try to save lives and try to get back in contact with their families and that. And we need to get them in rehab. And then when they come out of rehab, they need to get into monitoring for a number of weeks to make sure they're okay or come up with a halfway house or something where we can certainly um, you know, assist them when they're in recovery, keep them away from other addicts and try to give them that support. Now, I know we try our best, and as I say, it's a homeless unit and that, but there is a, people trying to get off drugs while there are others there who are, who are actively using it, and it's very difficult. I've brought this up repeatedly, and when is the investment going to be in to address this issue where people are, are dying. Okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor. We're going to bring in maybe Martin Tom there. Could maybe ask in a wacky resources that's, that Councillor McCocky is talking about and facilities. Is Martin there? Yeah. I am, Provost. Thanks. Um, actually, given the previous conversations that we'd had with Councillor McCocky, um, I've raised this at the Health Improvement Strategic Board as being a, a primary area for focus for Falkirk. Um, and they've agreed to do a bit of work looking specifically at developing services for people with gambling issues. So I'm hoping that over the course of the next few months, we'll actually begin to pull together a plan that we can actually do something really meaningful in Falkirk. Um, it's very early stages, but the fact that we've got the um, health Improvement Strategic Board um, looking at this, I think, is a big step forward for us. Um, but I'm happy to keep members updated around progress of that work as it develops um, over the next months. Thanks. I thank okay. you, and Martin. Could we get an update on the possibility of getting rehabs or halfway houses for folk that's in recovery to try to take them back to to be active and members of society again? Right. I think I think Martin has alluded to that's the type of information that will be coming back to Councillor McCockley and other members. Okay. Councillor Coombs, then Councillor Binney, and then we'll go back to the, the leader. Thanks, Provost. Uh, John's actually asked a few of the questions that I had intended to ask about resources, um, but I'm, I'll try and skip through them. Um, the, first of all, it is a great report, the energy and commitment of the people involved 
isn't in any doubt whatsoever. Um, but it's a great report because I don't think there's very much in there that we can argue with. Um, who's going to argue with improving outcomes for our residents? I mean, nobody's going to argue, for instance, that we need, um, I see the mental health one, outcome nine, that there are fewer deaths due to suicide. Of course, everybody's going to agree to that, but it is a, a plan, as they say, and as I say, John touched on it, plans are great, but how do we actually know that we're going to have the tools to do the job here? The aspirations are fine, but with the same thing as the financial report, I find myself questioning whether the community planning partnerships aspirations can actually be achieved. Um, Douglas mentioned earlier about the, the, the lack of resources and finances impacting on some of the programmes. So can I ask um, probably Kenneth uh, if he believes that the resources to implement this plan will be um, available? I mean, given the, we can't disassociate this from, from the budget. So either over the next three years or over the 10 years of the plan, uh, does the chief executive think that, or how much of this are we actually going to successfully implement? Dennis. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Provis. I suppose to go back to um, a number of my introductory um, comments, these plans have been brought together from existing um, plans um, within the different partners, which are um, in many uh, parts resourced. So it's, it's about, um, uh, it is resourced to a large degree through existing work that is ongoing. And I suppose the, the, one of the really important things about the community planning partnership is the bringing together of these resources across the different partners to maximize um, the impact of that. So um, I, can, I can't put a, a figure on it, Provost, in terms of how much of this can we say is absolutely fully resourced and how much uh, we can say that actually there's a, there's a, a problem there, because the picture is a bit mixed, but it is certainly true to say in terms of some of the newer areas of focus, and I suppose climate change uh, is an obvious example of that. We're at a fairly early stage. Um, as Douglas says, we do have a number of resources um, committed ourselves, the same for our partners. But if we are going to um, deliver the full aspirations of this plan um, over the period, then there will need to be resource decisions to support that um, over time. But there is an awful lot of resource across the public sector um, and indeed the voluntary sector in Falkirk sitting behind the delivery of these actions. So lots of progress is being made, lots of progress will be made, and there will need to be some financial decisions further down the line to support particular aspects of the work, I've no doubt. Thank you. Um, Any other questions, well, Councillor I'm not, I'm not sure that that actually answered my question. Um, it's, well, if you can't put specifics on it, then perhaps the, the chief executive could tell me um, how confident he is, just a, a you know, 100% confident, 50% confident, because the, the direction of travel here, as I said, this plan as a plan is absolutely aspirational. But I, I may have aspirations to be a size 10 tomorrow, but without actually having the tools to do the job, it's not likely. I'm glad you're laughing there, Councillor Buchanan. Sorry, Provost. But it, it's like, as the, as the Council Chief Executive, how confident is he that what's in this plan is actually going to come into fruition? Kenneth, get your crystal ball out. Um, well, well, two comments, perhaps, um, uh, Provost. You know, I can't quote the, the financial figures lying behind all of these um, outcomes. That isn't because they don't exist, because all these organisations have budgets, and these budgets are committed uh, to take forward, forward these, um, these outcomes. Um, so funding is, is there across the partners uh, to deliver these outcomes. Um, I'm not going to put a percentage um, figure um, on this. What I would say, though, is on the basis of the resource that's there, on the basis of the commitment 
of the partners on the basis of the engagement of our uh, communities and engage on, on, the, on the basis of the record of the work being done over the last two years, we will make very substantial progress against the issues in this in this plan. And there will be, you know, issues that arise, unpredictabilities that get in, in, in the way. But I am very confident that the community planning partnership with this plan can make a significant impact across the range of these outcomes. Thank you. Any further questions, Councillor Kims? Uh, I, I have, Provost. Um, I just feel quite despondent. As I said, it's my 10th year uh, as a councillor. Um, and like Alison, it will be my last year as a councillor. And I just feel that it's deja vu. All of these plans and all of these great aspirations have been getting talked about for a long, long time. And I, I don't feel as if we're moving much further forward. However, I have just one final question. Um, given that we have said that this is extremely important and that the work being done here is, is crucial for the, the people out there for the support that they need in various aspects of it. And item eight, the monitoring and evaluation, 8.1 states that the community planning partnership will monitor and evaluate the delivery of the plan against the Falkirk plan delivery and monitoring plan and report progress annually. Given the importance that's been given to this, um, as with all our actions, the, the the promise of it happening and the important issue here is what impact will it have? So why are we just measuring and reporting back annually on right. these issues? Simple question. You want to come in, Mr. Laurie, on that? Um, yes, thank you. Um, I mean, the community planning partnership meets six times a year or thereabouts. We have a forward program uh, of meetings. Indeed, it's in, included um, in in one of the appendices. So I can't lay my hands on it straight away. But um, the the forward plan of meetings, and we have reports on these various themes coming back to every meeting of the community planning partnership. So the community planning partnership is monitoring this um, every six weeks or thereabout, focusing um, a theme. Um, at the time, um, the annual report is um, indeed a statutory requirement um, under the uh, Community Empowerment um, Act. So there will be an annual report that will be um, uh, to the Community Planning Partnership, but also made um, made public. And um, I think that's an important um, element of you know being able to demonstrate where progress has been made and be able to. Um, you know, challenge or take appropriate actions uh, where um, uh, progress isn't being made or isn't being made um, uh, sufficiently quickly. And and if I, if I may, Provost, just to say that um, you know, from my perspective, community planning in Falkirk feels very different from how it felt um, when I joined the council a number of years ago. Um, uh, simply because it felt like more of a bureaucratic exercise, and the and now from my perspective, there is an awful lot of uh, energy and commitment behind it, which I think was less evident um, previously. So that is, I believe, a positive development. Okay, then thank you for that, Councillor Coombs. Thank you for your question. Could I say at this stage before I bring Councillor Binney in, um, you're the third person that's intimated that they're they're going to not be standing again. Can I say to everybody that please reconsider? We need we need the valuable experience. The councillors have been here for some time. Okay, Councillor Binney. Thank you, Provis. Uh, thank you very much for this report. There's been a lot of work and detail that's gone into it to actually improve for the people in our communities and also communities themselves. Uh, I really just kind of have an observation as a matter of fact. Um, one thing I've noticed, I'm looking at all the themes as well, and one thing I did notice it says, uh, I don't actually see in it that it's actually connected to gender-based violence, substance use, and obviously our health and well-being. And with regards, um, you know, a lot of my constituents that come to me, this is really a big issue in the community. It's about having safer communities 
improving life. And you, everybody, I'm sure all councillors are well aware of, you know, there's been an increase in antisocial behaviour and the impact that it has on our people and our communities. And that, in actual fact, can impact greatly on health and well-being. It causes fear, you know, with a lot of elderly people or even with a lot of younger people. Um, and also, antisocial behaviour in communities as well, it actually stops um, people using areas in our communities as well, like parks. For example, if there's um, an area in a park that's got a lot of antisocial, but what you find is people won't go, go near there. So I'm wondering, with regards to all these themes, why we haven't included that in our, our Falkirk plan. So which, and of course, our young people as well, so which part of the plan can be, which part of the plan can support reducing antisocial behaviour in our community, which actually affects a lot of people um, at the one time? And I don't really see a mention of that. And as I say, it can affect mental health, it can affect substance uh, abuse as well, um, all these themes, but there doesn't seem to be any mention of that how we can improve on that. You know, if we've got a community partnership with a lot of partners, what is the action plan so we can reduce antisocial behaviour in our communities and make it a safer place for everybody and a happier place? You've touched, you've touched on a, a very, very valid point. I think every every elected member has a bone of contention as antisocial behaviour in their communities. It's a blight on society, and as you say, it affects everybody, young and old. Um, Mr. Law, you want to come back in on that one? Why this really hasn't been highlighted as a maybe a significant area in this report? <clears throat> Thank you, Provost. I'm going to suggest that um, Kenny Gillespie come in on this item, please, Provost. Okay. Provost, do yourself. Yep. 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 So. One of the things to feed back, and although members may not feel this is, this is the information they're hearing, but it certainly wasn't something that was prioritised and expressed through our community when we did ask for the feedback, as said earlier by Jen Kerr and others. We do have a community safety partnership which exists for to deal with that, and that would be certainly a route. And it's very much focused on our community action plans, and we spoke about that earlier. There is lots of differences and causes for reasons in neighbourhoods for antisocial behaviour, so it's quite well spread, albeit it does have a theme on the things we've spoke about. We spoke about earlier about housing first and all the different issues that we heard. The idea of housing first, which ties back to this, is making sure that we have a multi-agency approach to things. So we, what we find is if somebody has one issue, there may be other issues that can come on to that, either through debt, through gambling, things that were mentioned earlier. So that's the idea of the multi-agency approach. So things like the antisocial behaviour, how to live, how to be respectful, will tie in with all these other agencies that feed in. Albeit it's not got specific within the aspects here, it is getting dealt with behind that plan, but it certainly feeds into some of the, the issues in the main part of the Falkirk plan. Okay. Councillor Binney, do you want to come back in? Yeah, I just wanted to come back in. How do you measure that then? I mean, I haven't I haven't actually heard a bit of reduction in that. So we need that data to see that that's, you know, all these plans are working. We just can't say that we're working behind the scenes and we're doing all these things. We have to see some data to say that antisocial behaviour is reducing in the communities. And I, to be honest, I am not hearing that. Jenny, you want to come back in? Provost and, and uh, Councillor Binney might remember there was a report went to scrutiny before and it was a part of the scrutiny panel. And there was feedback, feedback given at that time on the progress that was made. And certainly there will be a course of recall to that to see how the action is put in and how the impact that has been. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Binney. That was a very valid question. Straight to the leader of the council. I think we've had a really good debate on this. There have been a lot of questions asked and um, we're hoping that this is going to be taken forward in a very positive way. Councillor Michael John. Provost, um, I, I'm, I'm a wee bit kind of perplexed that we've got we, we do have some well experienced members that have been in the council for a long time, and um, you know involved previously with the community planning partnership, 
and um, it's, it's a wee bit um, you know, frustrating hearing some of the comments today and not actually understanding the strategic nature of the community planning partnership and that the partners are the delivery arm of it and um, what, the, what the role of the council is. And it, it, it's been despairing hearing some of the negativity um, about the, particularly for the staff that have been involved in drawing this up because there's a huge amount of work being done um, to bring this forward. And um, they, they have been very positive because they really want to see it make a difference. Um, it's, it's something that has been very much um, evidence based through the data. There's data to back up what's been brought forward. Um, there's been um, consultation and discussions with the communities and their lived experience is all going into bringing this forward. Um, and it aligns with our, clearly with our corporate priorities within the council. And if the resources are not there to be able to deliver on that, then um, we need to reflect on that ourselves um, because it's elected members that direct the resources. Um, so um, I think that that's something that as we're coming up to the budget, that that's, people need to take on board um, going forward. Um, I think it is hugely positive because it's looking forward and um, it's, it's looking to actually make a difference. Um, we're not, Falkirk Council um, and even you know, our, our partners aren't going to eradicate poverty. It's, it's take something far greater than, than just us to be able to eradicate poverty going forward. Um, what we can do is, is look to start to make the right steps that, with the levers that we have locally um, to try and, and reduce poverty, mitigate it and um, work with governments in order to be able to eradicate it. But that takes time. That, that potentially can take decades. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. But we just need to make sure that we're doing whatever we can in, in our own council area um, to improve um, the lives of, of our, our local citizens. And again, you know, we all know about fuel poverty. It's been very pertinent. But Falkirk Council doesn't have the levers to change that. All we can do is look to support and mitigate where possible and continue to feed back to those that have um, the ability and, and try to influence that. Climate change, the SPR, no budget. Well, we've heard in, in the last discussion, um, in order to be able to have um, the money to be able to invest, then we, we've got too many buildings. We need to reduce the number of buildings. But until we are prepared to start to take decisions on that, um, then we're not going to be able to get that traction. And, and you know, that, that's, that's um, something that, you know, again, is within members' gift. Um, but I, I, I do commend the report and the action plan. And I think that it's disappointing that people haven't um, been as positive and, and get behind that and, and, and want to actually make the difference. Um, I think we've got the right um, priorities. Um, our, our communities are telling us that. Um, we have got an action plan that, that will help to start to deliver on that. We have a robust monitoring plan, something um, that's far more robust than we've ever had before. Um, and that's been taken from a lot of the learning and the fresh approach by the new staff that have come in. Um, and therefore, we have the ability to get that assurance going forward. And if it's not right, then we need to tweak it. We need to change it to make it make sure it is right going forward. And that is up to us along with our partners. Um, but I just um, want to again say thanks to the staff um, who have pulled this together and their commitment. And thanks to our partners um, who've signed up and, and um, will be looking to direct their resources into delivering on those priorities. And we just now need to get on with it and make sure um, that, that we do our bit um, within the council. Um, and um, I, I would ask members to, to actually you know, take that on board and endorse the plans that we've got um, and, and, and work with it going forward. Um, thanks very much, Provis. Okay, thank you. Shall we read the recommendation? Agreed. Thank you. That takes us on to item five, the, the last item on the agenda today. Appointment process for the post of the Director of Transformation, Communities and Corporate Services. The report is by our Chief Executive. It's pages 85 to 89 on your agenda. Thank you very much, Mr. Laurie. Thank you, um, Provost. Um, at the Council meeting on the 8th of December, uh, members were advised of the retirement of the Director of Corporate and Housing Services and agreed the focus 
of, of the current uh, jobs should be reviewed to ensure the findings of the best value uh, report were appropriately reflected in it. And this report provides an update uh, to members on this work, including the, the review of the job title. Um, and just before I turn to the details of the report, in relation to the recommendations, um, following a further discussion with the uh, Chief Governance Officer, I'd like to amend the first recommendation to read approve rather than note. Um, on balance, we felt that was the more uh, appropriate recommendation. So, um, the current um, director, Stuart, um, leaves uh, the capital uh, shortly. This leaves uh, a significant vacancy um, within the senior management team for a role that has uh, strategic responsibility for both the Council's Section 95 and monitoring officers, as well as um, lead responsibility for corporate services, transformational change, best value, and performance management. And in, in addition, of course, the post has responsibility for housing uh, and community. So it sits right at the center of the council, providing leadership direction and guidance on a range of key issues, which impact on council finances, service transformation, delivery and performance. So in considering the findings of the best value um, uh, report, a number of the recommendations relate to issues which fall within the responsibility of this role, including transformation performance, community engagement, empowerment, and equalities. And within this, I think the delivery of the transformational change program and the savings associated with it is of the most critical uh, importance. And this role needs to provide leadership for that. And that leadership needs to be proactive, innovative, and uh, collaborative. So building on, um, on that and building on the recent work to improve relationships and joint working with our um, communities, we've reviewed what sits within this job and our view that whilst there are no changes to the functional responsibilities, which were of course agreed by the council in March 2021, and these are finance, governance, housing and communities, and people, technology and transformation, it would be appropriate given the, uh, the, the proposed emphasis of this job to switch the title to transformation communities and corporate services. Now, I don't think there's any such thing as a perfect job title, um, Provost, and me and a number of my colleagues, the senior managers in the service talked about some of the possibilities. Um, and this is perhaps slightly lengthier than we might have ideally hoped, but we do think um, on the basis of our discussions that it is uh, an appropriate title and will hopefully bring in the kind of candidates we would seek and wish to have in this uh, role. So, subject to uh, agreement of this report by the Council, the job profile will be submitted to the Appointments uh, Committee for approval, as is the normal process. And just before I turn to the uh, recommendations, Prof, it's just at 5.8, um, I set out the, the, the fact that members should also note that interim arrangements are being put in place for both the director role and the chief financial officer positions on a temporary basis pending the completion of the relevant recruitment exercises. So, to go back to the um, recommendations um, as amended, it is recommended that the Council approve the change to the job title of the Director of Corporate and Housing to that of Director of Transformation, Communities and Corporate Services, and that powers are delegated to the Appointments Committee to make an appointment to the post um, on a permanent basis. Thank you, Provost. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chief Executive. We'll go straight to the Leader of the Council. Councillor Michael John. Thank you, Provost. Um, I, I think this is a, a relatively straightforward report. I think it explains um, the, 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 um, the, the direction of travel that um, the Chief Executive just outlined. Um, I can fully understand, um, as a result of the best value, that they need to highlight the, um, the transformation um, aspect of the role and um, therefore um, seeking to um, make that more um, apparent within the actual job title. It does make it a long job title, title and I'm not sure if there's a, a decent acronym that can be got from that, um, but I'm sure it will be um, a, a working title will be eventually um, worked through. But um, 
happy um, that we, we move forward with the um, advertising and appointments process um, and the arrangements that have been put in place um, to, to cover the, the particular posts um, during um, the vacancies until the, the permanent position is taken up. Uh, I'm therefore happy to move the report, the recommendations, and approve the, the, the change of the job title and the delegated powers to the appointments committee for the recruitment process. Thanks, Provost. Thank you. Have you got a seconder there? Provost Councillor Councillor Gardner again. Happy to second. Thank you, Councillor Gardner. I'll go straight to Alan Nimmo, uh, in charge of the Labour Group today. Thanks, Councillor Nimmo. You get any amendment? No, not at all. No, we're happy to agree. You agree? Thank you. I'll go now to the Conservative group. Who's going to be speaking on their behalf with Nigel Harris? Yeah, Thank Harris. Thank you, yeah. Thank you Provost. And uh, we have uh, no amendment. Can I just say that um, I know there was a little bit of consternation when we put back the approval of this uh, from a previous council meeting pending the change of a uh, title. And I think it was very appropriate that the council, the full council, uh, has been explained the rationale behind uh, the new job title. And I think, as uh, our chief executive has pointed out, it has been changed to reflect the very strategic, important uh, place of uh, the uh, transformation within that job. So uh, thank you for that, and we are happy to uh, approve the change of title. Okay, then, everybody's agreed. Can we agree, then, the recommendation? Agreed. Hold on agreed. a second, sorry. Sorry, a wee bit premature. Councillor Coombs, I didn't see your hand up. Thanks, Provost. Um, it's just a very simple question. What are the interim arrangements? Um, and, and I don't know if it's a secondary question, I'm surprised that we're only just putting these these appointments out for interviewer uh, just now, given that both um, the chief finance officer and Stuart as the director gave notice quite some time ago. I just think that, as we've said, given the importance of some of the transformation that's desperately needed to go with, on within the council, um, at this level, we're going to be a minimum of probably what four to six months before anybody's in place. So I think the interim arrangements are, are quite important. Who's picking up okay. the slack? Okay, fair question, and I apologise for no seeing you, but um, you were undercover there. Um, uh, Council, could we say that Mr. Laurie would come back on this question for Councillor Kent? Yes, thank you, um, Provost. So. Um, we will have an um, acting chief finance officer and an acting director of corporate and housing um, pending the permanent appointments. That process is well underway, and the intention is that these appointments will be made appropriately before um, the director and the chief finance officer uh, leave the council. So there will be uh, continuity. Okay, then. I'm just. I'm, I'm concerned. It's. Um... Obviously, no criticism of, of uh, Mr. Duff, but I think it was a full year before, in fact, it was over a year between the previous director of development services left before Malcolm was put in place. And the strain and the stress that that puts on these senior officers to, to act up uh, and the knock-on effect of that, I think, does have a serious impact on the on the council. Okay, okay, thank you very much for that. Okay, then, so we're 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 agreed. We agreed to the recommendation. That brings us to the end of the meeting. Just to say once again, if Mr. Ritchie is still with us, Mr. Ritchie, very best wishes to you and your family in the future. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Provost.